Members of Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. And welcome to the resumption of Central Committee meeting number 15. This Central Committee meeting started yesterday for the handling of the draft budget 2024. Following presentations by the ministers and questions by the members of parliament, we are now continuing with the individual ministers providing answers to the members of parliament. And subsequently, of course, members of parliament will have the opportunity to ask either for clarification or for the questions to the minister. The first minister in this round to provide answers to members of parliament was Minister Otley. And after ensuring that the budget, the final, <coughs> sorry, the final version of the budget is the one registered at parliament, we now continue after the lunch break having ascertained that that is the case. Members of Parliament, as explained during the break, the English version of the budget, which all members have received, is a correct draft in terms of numbers and figures. The draft in Dutch that we received via the official channels while it mentions the correct total on the first pages of the budget, the, the numbers and elucidation were an earlier draft than the final draft that we needed to receive. That is now being corrected. You have just received a correct copy and the official registration of that correct copy is now taking place. And I give this explanation that in the event members of parliament ask regarding numbers that were, that were in the draft that we received previously, the Dutch draft, we will then have to give the opportunity that the minister can explain and respond adequately to the members of parliament. So while we had anticipated that ministers will come to answer in the first round, so to speak, and the second round. We have also, or we are also leaving the possibility for ministers to return even after that, if something is not clear, if the information is not in sync with what the ministers are presenting. Just that you know, mightn't be necessary, but if so, we will open that opportunity and would be requesting the ministers to come back again if necessary. Stating all of that, so again, the, the Dutch version that you just a couple of minutes ago received, those numbers are the correct numbers from which you would be asking your questions, just like the English version is the correct version with numbers and elucidation. Members, I hope to have clarified where we stand right now with the different versions of the budget. And I continue now with the session that was started this morning, namely the responses to come from the individual ministers with us here this afternoon. And who I welcome along with his staff is the Minister of TIAT, Minister Lambrix. Minister Lambrix, welcome, and I invite you to take the floor to respond to the questions posed to you for your ministry yesterday. <coughs> Minister Lambrix, you have the floor. Good afternoon, Chair Lady. Good afternoon to the Khafir. Good afternoon to the MPs. Good afternoon to everyone listening through the media. <coughs> My first question was from MP Akim Arendel. What is the update of the airport and how far are we with the construction? Can a completion date be provided? Um, the airport not too long ago um, opened the departure hall, and then also the check-in area is now open. Um, the last phase of the airport is the arrival hall, which is currently under construction and set to be completed by June 2024, once there are no 
further interruptions or anything that comes up which we at this time don't anticipate. Um, second question, oh, we didn't have any from MP Luke Mercedina, no questions. And then the third set of questions were from MP Ludmila de Weaver. <clears throat> they were concerning the hires and the people that left um, the ministry. Um, in 2022, we had eight people that left. <clears throat> we had a total of two new hires, which consisted of three that went on pension, one that was dismissed, two that passed away, and two that resigned. Um, in 2023, we had two persons that left with four new hires. The two persons that left, one went on pension and one resigned. Second question was the bathrooms on Mullet Bay um, and the shortage of restrooms in town, also about the old permits being granted. Um, first of all, when it comes to the cement garbages and the overflow and those things that are mentioned on the boardwalk, that is certainly not the um, intention for Mullet Bay. Me as minister, I would never you know, want to see any garbage um, disposal areas or those things in between where people lounge. Um, there would have to be more towards the back, so that would be my solution and a different type of garbage system than just making a, a box and throwing garbage into. Um, the restrooms on Mullet Bay, we had the CAPEX um, amended and we had um, added in 2023, which was mainly to assist with the marketplace. Um, the additional funds that left after the marketplace were intended to, of course, um, execute other projects, which the bathrooms in Mullet Bay were one, um, one idea or vision that I had um, based on the frequency of people going to that beach, um, locals and visitors alike, and more and more people, you know, sorry, defecating and doing those things in the water in between the trees and the foliage, um, between the stray animals on the roads already and then the humans also doing that, it doesn't make the beach too pleasant. Um, so, you know, for stench, for these kind of things and hygienic reasons, um, the bathrooms are very much needed, in my opinion. But this, again, was something that we would like to see happen. Um, it is not something set in stone or that it is going to happen. It was an idea for the additional CapEx funds that were remaining. Um, the possibility to charge persons um, and make warnings for the bathrooms on the beach. Um, the same thing I do agree. Yes, um, we should have signs. We should have warnings on the beach. Um, and we would have to work together with, I believe, Rami to get those things executed and put in place. The next set of questions were from MP Kevin Maingrait. Can you please elaborate on the status of the marketplace? Has a date been given with regards to commencement of the project? Um, no date has been set for the commencement of the project yet. Um, however, I'm pleased to announce that everything has now, yes, been completely signed off. Um, so the missing signatures are on. Um, I was out of office last week, sick um, with the flu. So that was done while I was out and I overlooked that part, so I did mention something, but it was actually signed off. So it is on the way to come um, for the last approval of all ministers and then from there we can commence. Um, the time for the construction itself remains still the same, 75 days approximately to start to finish. Does the budget include a temporary location? Is the location identified and how does the minister ensure for traffic to the marketplace? Um, I have the answer, yes. Um, it was, um, everything is in place for the relocation. I just found the question a little bit funny um, <clears throat> because the MP at the time was in my cabinet and he was part of all of that um, procedure. But yes, it was, um, it was done and the relocation is set right across in the corner of the parking lot. So basically flip the marketplace over. So it's in the same area, the foot traffic basically that's going there will still be going because it's in the same view. It's not really being moved to a whole different area. And as the, the construction time is very short, um, it would not take up too much um, of the parking situation. Is there a policy that includes the enhancement of the public transportation system? If yes, how does your plan for the bus terminal fit into this policy? No, a policy does not currently exist. The bus terminal was a vision I had as a minister when I came in to better control the flow of buses in only some areas and not others. Ensuring every district is properly serviced. So sometimes we have buses that, you know, you stand up and you see buses, everyone going to Marigo, Marigo, Marigo. Someone is standing up to go to St. Peter's, we don't see any. The idea was to have um, a dispatcher there that can then have a turnaround space for those buses and properly dispatch them to make sure that everyone is going where they have to go. 
the fourth set of questions by MP Melissa Gums. <clears throat> Regarding the four LBHAMs, <clears throat> can you provide a legal basis to regulate those laws? The LBHAM and the bus tariffs is based on Article 23 of the bus transportation, the ordinance LVO person, person, personen vervoer. The LBHAM for the lottery sales agents is based on Article 3 and, Article four, and quarter of the Article 4, Paragraph 2 of the Lottery Ordinance. LBHAM online gaming fees is based on Article 3 and partial of the Article 2 of the Online Gaming Ordinance. The LBHAM automatic driving exam is based on Article 90 of the Road Traffic Ordinance. Second question, the embarkation cards, will it be physical cards? The intention is not for Minister that to be physical. Minister Lambrix, I hate to interrupt you, but I need to adjourn for a few minutes that some technical issues be addressed. So if you could just hold your last statement and I will adjourn for five minutes. Following a brief interruption, I now ask the Minister Lambrix 
Um, firstly, my apologies for having to interrupt you in providing the answers, but I now invite you to continue with answering the questions. Minister Lambrix. Thank you, Chair Lady. So back to the questions. Question two from MP Melissa Gums. Embark embarkation cards, will they be physical cards? The intention is not for there to be physical cards, but to capture the information via online platforms, so similar to how other countries are doing, like Aruba, Dominican Republic, um, to save also on paper. Um, the eco-diversification, question three, what has been done to encourage diversification? Diversification through education, et cetera. How has the ministries worked with other ministries? The following activities have been done over the years in an attempt to stimulate the econ economic diversification. St. Martin became a member of the Caribbean Association of Investment Promotion Agencies as a way to exchange best practices and gain knowledge on attracting sustainable investments. Subsequently, the ministry developed and published its policy in investment promotion and strategy in quarter four of 2022 towards economic diversification. This includes the identification of vehicles to execute the policy initiatives. A bid was put out seeking an entity to carry out the investment promotional activities in absence of the actual IPA. The Council of Ministers decided that the EDC would be the most suitable vehicle for such. The EDC was therefore reactivated and the board was installed and such, and sorry, the board was installed and the ministry was prepared to provide a subsidy to the EDC to carry out such investments as promotional opportunities. Additionally, the, 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 the diversification areas as outlined in the aforementioned policies were sent to the NRPB with the request for funding request in these areas to be prioritized. <laughs> Lastly, the ministry attended an investment conference last year where several foreign investors expressed an interest in investing on St. Martin. We are currently in discussion with one who's interested in carrying out a feasibility study on the island. My fifth set of questions from MP Grisha Heilega Martin. Can the Minister of TIAT provide an update on the status of the marketing reps' contracts and the status of their payments? Big Ideas Branding and Marketing Firm was contracted in 2023 until 2026, and they are still awaiting their payment. Diamond PR and Sales and Marketing Communication contract was signed in quarter one. Sorry, the contract was signed in quarter one and paid in quarter two, or will be paid in quarter two of 2024. Embrace, the Caribbean PR and Marketing Communication contract signed in quarter one of 2023, and they were paid. USP, the contract signed, the payment is due. Vox International, with an X, um, is a Canadian market, their payment is also due. Inter American Network, they deal with the Latin American market, they were recently selected as the new rep for St. Martin. No payments were done yet. Question two, what steps are being taken to plan and execute the marketing campaign for the upcoming summer season? A workshop has been held with the stakeholders in the private sector to strategize on the best components for a summer campaign. It was established a summer campaign with added value will be supported that, compos that composes of free nights or discounts and other added social values um, so, social media, sorry, channel, channels such as Facebook, TikTok, B2C, as well as online travel agents such as Expedia, Hopper, Travel Spike, and B2B strategies via travel agents and tour operators will be used to promote the market. The summer campaign is being finalized and it will be shared with the stakeholders. Um, SHDA is to finalize the package and have a buy-in to launch the campaign in the next 14 days, so about two weeks we should launch that campaign and make it known to everyone. How does the minister view the proposal for establishing an informal tourism advisory council and what actions, if any, are being considered to establish such? <clears throat> By centralizing marketing efforts, the STA can efficiently locate resources, avoiding duplication of efforts and ensuring that marketing campaigns reach the intended audiences effectively and increase tourism receipts. While establishing the STA, an informal tax consisting of government and private sector representatives can assist in executing the tourism action plan. What strategies have the minister and COM considered to address the challenges posed 
by extended low season and its impact to businesses and workers. To develop a summer, um, we worked on developing summer and fall campaigns and partner with stakeholders for additional events and special events, target certain markets and demographics um, to ensure that we have um, more stuff going on beyond just the April carnival and that we continue until the new high season kicks in. So basically the summer months, um, also the extra air lift that we have also contributes to that and also the reduced airfares that we have now between a lot of the U.S. Um, states and with U.S. carriers, they are also helping a lot to bring in um, and keep the flow of tourists going. Are there specific metrics or benchmarks being proposed to measure the success and initiatives aimed at addressing the shoulder of low seasons? How does the Minister of Tourism plan to shift the focus from quantity to quality of our visitors? The strategy to move from more quantity to quality was already being used as the reopening strategy post-COVID by targeting higher disposable income demographics, promoting experiences and value-added luxury experiences as the overall strategy. Question five, or question six, sorry. What, has the, what progress has been made in implementing a structured approach to collecting room tax from platforms like the Airbnb and VRBO? How much was generated in 2023? This um, would be a question that I would have to redirect to the Minister of Finance, and he would be able to answer that for you. Um, this next question also, are there any challenges anticipating enforcing the tax compliance among the shared economy and accommodations, and how does the Minister plan to address them? This also would be one that the Minister of Finance would have to address. Um, airlift development strategy, can the Minister give an update on the establishment of the airlift development strategy, particularly in light of the ongoing construction of the PGIA and increased competition from neighboring islands. Um, the STB and the Simartin Airport collaborate on our airlift development. Um, me, myself, I was part of a, um, a, a trip that we took back in October, end of October. We visited basically all the U.S. carriers. Um, it was something that was done after quite some time from what I heard from the airlines. Um, it's close to a decade that they haven't seen anyone from Samaritan at their doorstep. Um, I believe by doing so and visiting the airlines and continuing that relation and dialogue with them, um, it will only make us stronger partners and continue to have the additional airlift added. Also for them to have the understanding and first-hand um, information from us about the airport when we were there um, was also quite helpful for them so they didn't have to guess and worry what the media is saying and what is fact and what is not fact. So that was also something um, that worked out quite well. Um, question eight, how does the minister intend to ensure affordability and improve connectivity as part of his strategy? Um, as mentioned a few minutes ago, um, the affordability is there now for the airlines. Um, at any given time, anyone here can go online and search a flight from here to Miami as an example, and you'll see you can get fares as low as $230 round trip um, I never ever achieved um, in history that low. Um, a lot of airlines have added flights, so the con connectivities are there. Um, and right now, to try to add more until the airport is fully finished, I don't think is something that we should push for because we already are at max capacity with the, the developments and stuff that are going on in the airport with the construction and the temporary arrival hall. Um, but when that is completed, definitely um, there has to be continued push for that so that we can continue to grow on it. The cruise conversion program, can the minister give an update on the cruise conversion program? We have not finalized one to date. We have been in discussion with a third party. Um, what factors are considered in evaluating its potential and financial benefits to the island? In the cruise conversion program, factors such as campaigns to attract passengers to return to St. Martin as still visitors, through the app and the website, um, offers that are part of the program to book accommodations, encourage dining, activities, tours, shopping, are all factors to evaluate the financial benefit. In addition, offers that are added value to incentives and incentives to the travel agent that stay over during the low season period should be a factor to evaluate the financial benefit. Question 10, what steps are being taken to redevelop or, rep or reposition Phillipsburg to increase economic activities in the evening as well as to eliminate, alleviate visitor traffic congestion in all other areas on the island. Um, 
our summit um, that we have planned for May and June of this year for Phillipsburg, Liven It Up, is one. Um, we also have a, a planned, um, the STB is busy with it and finalizing, a Boardwalk Alive project, which once a week we will have something on the boardwalk to enhance the experience for visitors and also to bring the locals alike back out so that we can have some togetherness again and also leave a nice taste in the visitors, you know, view when they're leaving the island, similar to what Mexico does and the different things when cruise passengers head back to the ship, that they have a little show, some entertainment, and show what St. Martin is all about. Are there any specific initiatives planned to enhance the cultural, historical, and agricultural experiences for visitors? Um, the Tourism Awareness Program, STB has ex executed some projects with visiting schools and provided presentations. Also, STB developed a video on our tourism um, showing the unsung heroes. Can you provide an update of the implementation of the proposal, proposed PR and training strategy to make residents aware of the importance of tourism and the potential career opportunities? This was addressed to the MECYS. -E the STB would like to have the budget to be able to execute a comprehensive program on tourism awareness, targeting the community, and promoting the various careers possible within the tourism industry. What progress has been made implementing, in implementing sen sensitization, sensitization programs, especially at elementary and secondary school levels? This was addressed to the ECYS um, in the yearly visits with the elementary schools and to educate tourism and possible careers as much as possible. Question 14. How is the minister addressing the request to streamline the clear in and out process for boats? Stakeholders are discussing the potential automation, automation sorry, of the clearing system, therefore creating a smoother and more streamlined process. Are there any identified bottlenecks in hindering development of the marine service sector? If so, what are they and what steps are being taken? The marine sector has expressed several concerns to the ministry in regards to providing assistance to develop and grow the sector, especially since it's been identified as a sector for diversification. Some of the bottlenecks expressed are as follows. Immigration requirements and the process and education possibilities, shore support services that allow the sector to ensure the business in the low season. However, this also includes the need of having import experts to work locally during that time. Uh, when Sorry, one second, during that time. The timeline for the visa process has known to also take quite a long time, especially when said services may only be requested at the end of the season, which leaves a very short window for application. Enforcement, the need to clar clearly identify who has the authority in the lagoon, especially when it comes to requesting permits, increase of breakings at marina, no clear indication of who's responsible, the Coast Guard or the police, then we have the infrastructure development, dredging of the lagoon and the channels. It is required to do so every, so every often to ensure that vessels can enter safely. However, processing times for the said request from all, re re all relevant bodies takes too long to secure the relevant equipment in time for the low season. The fees and services, um, the difference of fees when mooring in Phillipsburg versus Simpson Bay, and based on the type of service being provided by some vessels are waived. Um, in addition, the level of service being provided via the slack to visitors of said vessels prior to and upon arrival to ensure the consistency of standards, the need to also ensure hurricane passes are received prior to the season and notice to all mariners is circulated by the relevant authority to protect our lagoons during the season. So basically when a hurricane is approaching any foreign vessels also not to allow them to stay in the lagoon to make sure that we get them out on time so they have a safe haven to go to but not become our problems should there be any issues with the hurricane or damages. Um, these bottlenecks are currently being discussed between the relevant departments within TIAT and the marine industry. Discussions are being, are, are being scheduled with key stakeholders to address these concerns in addition to any other findings of the economic impact study currently ongoing to properly stimulate the industry in the coming years. The next question. What discussions have taken place regarding the establishments of an entity to coordinate dialogue between government and tourism stakeholders? None has, um, no discussions have been had. 
Number 17, are there still plans to establish the Samaritan Tourism Authority? If so, when will this body be set up? The advice is to move forward with setting up an STA, um, and it is being worked on. There was already a study being done in the past by EDC um, with the former board and management that they had there concerning also the STA. So we're working off of that study to continue on that path. How does the 2024 budget address and ensure reli reliable and structural funding for this entity? It does not reflect the funds will be allocated to set up the legal entity and develop the organizational structure. Border control systems, where is this identified in the budget? It is not in the budget as this is funded by the Samaritan Airport with an agreement that the STB and TIAT also owns the data and has the access to marketing data. What progress has been made in implementing the new border control system to provide a better information and data intelligence on arrivals? The online border control system, the EED card, is in its final stages. Um, Minis Justice can elaborate a little bit more on that also because they were part of that. How much data is currently being used? Um, so the data that we will be collecting from these ED cards, I believe that is where you're referring to that data. Um, that is to do the marketing to see where the people are coming from, the age, <coughs> demographics, the ages, um, what type of people, families, um, their income, what type of profession they have, um, so we can better you know, market and, and get the correct people to our shores. One second. Next question, the last carrying capacity study was done decades ago. Traffic congestion, Samaritan has significantly worsened. Surely you will agree that this situation is unacceptable for both residents and visit on, visitors on the island. <coughs> um, I didn't see much of a question, but yes, I can agree with that. Um, 21, could you please elaborate on the measures being taken to tackle this issue? This question would have to be answered by Vrami and Justice. <coughs> As TIAT we do, um, we are responsible for public transportation, but when it comes to the actual roads and traffic situations, those are still falling under the Justice and the Vrami. Are there any specific plans outlined in the national budget to address this pressing concern? <coughs> Again, this should be responded to by Vrami. How does the minister, ministry intend to utilize this data for targeted tourism investments? Um, with the results of the carrying capacity, we will be able to identify the tourism investment and can enhance our tourism project. Question 24, I have noticed that digital nomad segment has grown by leaps and bounds regionally in Curaçao, Aruba, Dominican Republic, etc., and internationally. What about St. Martin? St. Martin has always accommodated remote workers. Before COVID-19, when it became popular, there is a Nomad League program that was developed with time <coughs> and resources was the challenge in order to execute and market the program. It is the intention to still launch the Nomad League campaign. How much of the CapEx is spent in the marketplace in 2023? No expenses have yet been incurred from the CapEx um, for the market because we have not started the project yet. Can you list the projects and can you provide the amount spent? We spent 361,125 guilders on website development, 679,680 guilders on digital marketing and branding, 270,000 guilders on the video nature film, and 300,000 guilders on branding materials for conferences, events, and trade shows. So when we go to the FCCA, the C Trade, and those things that we have promotional material also to hand out. Can you specify the extent of the progress made on the development of the marketplace project and its timeline for completion? <clears throat> um, I'm the, the marketplace basically, um, the complete advice is, is done. Um, the drawings, everything are done. We have the building permit already. We have everything. It's basically just now um, for COM to approve. I did mention um, in my first presentation that two signatures are missing, but they were signed off. 
So hopefully that will get to come within the week or two and we will have that finalized. And the completion is about two and a half months, 75 days. Could you confirm if there's any bidding process conducted? Yes, a bidding process was conducted based on the terms and regulations. Were marketplace vendors involved in the entire process? Yes, all vendors were involved and were kept up to date through the process of the marketplace. Myself and some of my cabinet staff um, went and um, spoke to all of the members in the market. We showed them all the drawings. We explained them the relocation. Um, we even translated because some of them had difficulty with the English language. Um, and everybody is properly informed. Was or is there a project manager? There's no project manager because it's a very simple and straightforward project. As I mentioned, it's a 75-day project. Um, they are using the similar construction. I don't know if everyone can remember when DV was building during COVID with the foam and the solid concrete on the inside. So it's basically like a Lego project. It's not too, too difficult. Or, um, can you list all the investors for the project and detail any pending tasks? No pending tasks um, except for come to approve and to break ground and get started. Um, investors, we had the CapEx funds and we had some funds from um, the crew sector. Uh, they both contributed about half each of the total project, so 50-50. Can you, uh, additionally, what are the anticipated completion date of the project? So again, um, as soon as it's approved, um, 75 days would be the completion date. Then we have the vendor's village, if different from the marketplace. Funds were originally um, for the 2023 budget earmarked um, for the food truck village, um, which we didn't have time to, to fix the marketplace issue, and we had amended that on the budget, and we had said, no, it would not be for the food truck village. It would be moved for the marketplace in addition with the extra funds from the cruise line. So the food truck has been, that was always um, how it was. The research and development, intellectual property. Um, MP, I, a few of the questions, I had some difficulties on um, that something happened to the document. I noticed one of these here is not responded to or it's not on the document. I don't know if I can send you to see the research and development for the intellectual property. If I can send that one afterwards in writing, I would have to come back and say that, but I don't have it here. Um, the port of Gallus Bay and Marigo is expanding in its cargo facilities. What synergies are there with the PSG group of companies and how will this affect the port of St. Martin? Um, PSG remains open for all stakeholder collaborations. As a new niche market, um, they may be able to develop, may be able to be developed. We, however, will continue to invest in our product and services and maintain the lead in our hub function. Who are PSG? Um, they are the port of, who are PSG's competitors, and what are the differences in their rates? PSG is a leader in the Eastern Caribbean, and in, regra in regards to our cargo hub function, our competitors are the neighboring islands. Um, rates differ at each port in the region and do have different tariff structures. There are a lot of different ports. Um, each one has their own. None match exactly the same, so it's um, unless you have a specific port that you'd like me to look into. Um, it's a little bit difficult to answer that one in general. What is the PSG's position on the effects of the fuel tr throughput and the Caribbean or US market for fuel bunkering? Um, one of the port's main key companies is the servicing and fueling of vessels. Um, they are continuously striving to remain competitive in the fueling market um, and liaise with the industry partners to better understand the future of ship builds and the fuel consumption. So as we know, everything is still turning to the LNG, every conference, every time that we do go, um, it is being mentioned LNG. And then the second one that is being mentioned is hydrogen, but that is another 10 years out. So a lot of ports, including ours, are, are trying to focus and see if it makes sense to go into one or the other, or if to go into the other and then wait, or if to immediately use what is there now, which is the LNG. Um, Question 38, agriculture. It is evident that worldwide the food security, employment, and economic stability are important. Did you look at dedicated division or department for agriculture? If so, how would such initiative support small-scale farmers 
promote sustainable practices and enhance food resilience, complementing the tourist sector's growth and contributing to overall economic stability. Um, the Ministry outlined in its policy the need for the dedicated department for sustainable development of agriculture. Um, this is also supported by the stakeholders in the industry. The Ministry represented St. Martin in the Dutch Caribbean visioning proce process with former islands in the Netherlands and Tills to collectively advance our agricultural industries. During this first session, it became evident that St. Martin is the only island of the former Antilles without a dedicated department, an entity focused on agricultural development. As a ministry, we are limited in terms and expertise to develop these standards, plant health legislation, inspection of products, etc. The lack of such the legislation and standards makes it difficult for local agriculturists to grow beyond the 16 square miles. Even selling produce on the French side is impossible due to lack of standards of the Dutch side. We have seen as a result that certain businesses have relocated to the French side to better be able to have their products and packaging inspected and approved for sale and export. Um, myself, I went to that conference. Um, it was very enlightening. Um, even Little Sabre, they have their own um, you know, agricultural department, Stacia. Um, so it's something that we really do need, I believe, um, to have proper focus full-time on the agricultural part. Um, something else to be added, um, which someone asked about diversification a little bit in one of the questions. But since we're on this topic, um, the last FCCA conference that I went to, um, it was mentioned by some of the cruise lines that they are willing to even um, purchase produce, so do provisioning locally, but not importing it via containers, but that we can sell or grow sufficient tomatoes at a certain standard and have it inspected, you know, properly labeled. Um, they will be willing to even buy those things for us once we can properly produce it and supply it on demand as required, which is, again, something extra just to tourism um, by provisioning these ships, which will bring an extra income for the country. Just a little extra, sorry. With regards to the various public relations groups hired by the Ministry of TIAT, which takes on the largest part of the budget, what exactly is the role of the public relations firms in all markets and the responsibility? What monitoring and evaluation system is in place to make sure that they are working in terms of our main objectives of increased tourism? So true media monitoring, press releases, pitching services and storylines match with our journalists, media kit development, media outreach support, hosting of media, traditional influencers, bloggers, and vloggers. Additional measurements are crisis management, reputation replacement, sales services, tour operator debrief sessions, monthly live webinars, travel agent trade shows, staying on the latest trends, monitoring and choosing the right opportunities for the destination. Monthly reports are provided with essential information and performance indicators. These KPIs are the media coverage, press release pickup, social media engagement, lead generation, cost per acquisition, lead generation volume, engagement rate, click-through rate, email open and click rates, brand awareness, customer lifetime value, social media followers and growth rate, content performance. Question 40. Could the ministry elaborate on the key priorities of recently established EDC? <coughs> the St. Martin Economic Development Corporation was established and incorporated in July 23, 1998, focusing on several key priorities to promote economic growth and development in St. Martin. Some of these priorities could include job creation, which facilitates initiatives to attract investment and stimulate business growth, leading to the creation of new job opportunities for residents, Business development, providing support and resources to local businesses, including startups and SMEs, to foster entrepreneurship, innovation, and competitiveness within the market. Investment promotion, actively promote St. Martin as an attractive destination for domestic and foreign investment, encouraging capital inflows and economic diversification. Infrastructure development, collaborate with government agencies and private sector stakeholders to improve the infrastructure. Tourism enhancement to implement strategies to sustain, sustainably grow the tourism industry. Skills development to invest in the education and training programs to enhance the skills and capabilities of the local workforce, al aligning with the needs of emerging industries and sectors. Regulatory reform to review and update the regulations and policies related to business operations 
trade and investments. Sustainable development to incorporate principles of sustainability and resilience into the economic development strategies. International collaboration to strengthen partnerships and collaborations with regional and international organizations, governments, and businesses to leverage resources, expertise, and market opportunities for mutual benefits. Data and, an an data and analysis to conduct research and data analysis to identify emerging trends, opportunities, and challenges in the local and global economy. Um, some of these you would notice that the, it's not on my, but just from, so everyone can be clear. Um, the EDC, like I said, did um, do a study back a few years ago to do something similar to this Aruba Tourism Authority, um, which is the St. Martin Tourist Authority. So you'll see some of the things that the Tourist Bureau is currently also doing. The EDC would actually would be, would be the one preferably to do that because they are the ones that would be then that authority to you know, push those things forward and have it under one proper umbrella. What are the funding resources of the EDC? Outline them and please indicate how they fund economic development activities, initiatives. Originally, the EDC was intended to, financial, to be financially sustained through fees generating from management, managing the Simpson Bay Lagoon under its subsidy, subsidiary company, the SLAC, which is the Simpson Bay Lagoon Authority Corporation. However, the Island Council transferred all SLAC shares to the St. Martin Harbor, which now oversees SLAC operations and revenue collection from the Simpson Bay Lagoon. The first revenue generating project for the EDC was slated to begin in 1999. It involved 10.4 acres of land adjacent to the St. Martin Harbor, managed by Waterside Development Company, initially valued at $32 million. The objective was to develop the land for port-related purposes. However, the Island Council altered these plans, leading to the project suspension in 2001, with the land revalued at $21.3 million due to impairments. In 2002, four acres of the land were sold to a port subsidiary for $5.28 million to repay an existing loan, while efforts to secure a developer persisted. Subsequently, in 2007, the remaining land was divided with 0.9 acres allocated to the SPMD and 9.5 acres to Royal Caribbean Cruise Line at the reduced value of $6.65 million. While some funds generated through the, exchange, through the change of ownership of the land were earmarked for projects such as the Ring Road, Harbor Dredging, and the Boardwalk, the EDC received an annual payment of only $100,000 US dollars, which is set for the next 92 years which to date is, ex is, is, is its sole income stream since 2008. The new interim director and supervisory board is working with private partners locally and abroad to identify investment opportunities, which will become additional revenue streams for the EDC to continue its mission of promoting and developing St. Martin's economy. Question 43, is there a corporate code under EDC? Since its establishment, the St. Martin Economic Development Corporation operated with without an established corporate code. However, on Friday, March 1st, 2024, the Supervisory Board of Directors, the Interim Managing Director, and EDC's Legal Counsel formalized the resolution to adopt rules of order to comply with corporate governance standards. Is both St. Martin and Friends St. Martin members of the CTO, the Caribbean Trade Tourism Organization? Yes, both are still members, and in 2019, a decision was made to leave the membership, but was never finalized. A decision has to be made as the CTO contacted the STB, and the meeting was held with the CTO recently, and would like to present the new strategies so that we can continue our collaboration. My next question is from MP Roseburg. Where in the budget can I find activities related to the orange and blue economy? Is there, is there a connection with the Ministry of ECYS to promote the RNG economy? There is no specific budget post within the Ministry of TIAT. However, activities and initiatives to stimulate and promote diversifications are funded from budgeted subsidies, namely budget post 8270, point 44301, .832, the investment promotion budget. And the next budget is 8270.44301.844, the 
the SMB, SME budget. The ministry currently has close collaboration with the Culture Department and the Ministry of ECYS to promote the orange economy. Where can I find agriculture in the budget? Is there collaboration with ECYS to bring it into schools? The budget for activities and initiatives related to agriculture can be found in the budget subsidies, namely budget post 82, 70, point 44, 301, point 808. The Agri in Schools program is approved by the entire Council of Ministers, so yes, the Minister of ECYS is involved. Public transportation's permits. Clarify the policy and legal basis to issue those permits. The moratorium policy of public transportation licenses was updated in September 2023, and the public transportation ordinance that is the policy and the legal basis is the public transportation ordinance, the LVO Personum Vivur. I then have questions from MP Christopher Emanuel. The concrete benches in Front Street, no paint. Is that all we get? Beautification, etc. No, we are having a meeting with the Be the Change Foundation, which is also responsible for the mural projects throughout Front Street in town, Phyllisburg to discuss a sustainable project for the benches. Um, honestly, my vision for it was, um, you know, to display the local, you know, colorful stuff, but I took notice of the flag um, suggestion, and I think it's a very good one, and I have also passed that along. Um, is there a fix and repair plan for whoever contracted to make the benches? The fix and repair plan was not including the original build of the benches, However, just like all other government-owned buildings and properties and equipment, these benches should be maintained periodically by the public work staff. However, this will be brought up with the Minister of Romy within the department to see how we can arrange something together. Did the managing director of the airport contract, has it been extended? If so, for how long? It has not been extended. Um, it was set originally, I believe, to expire end of this year. MP Marlin, I have no questions. Then I have questions from MP La Cruz. What is the status of the amount of cruise calls to a port? Could you please let us know if the ministry has any plans to increase the calls and the plan to increase the tour tourists from the Caribbean mainly during the low season? Low season. Port St. Martin is projecting 505 calls for 2024. This is an increase of 3% since 2023. Um, concerning plans to increase the calls during the slow season, this is an ongoing strategic discussion with the respective cruise lines. Um, everyone is saying, um, yes, I can do it, I can do it, I can do it. Um, the fact of the matter is um, cruise lines operate in more than one region. They operate in the Caribbean, they operate in Europe, they operate in Asia, they operate in Alaska. Um, there's certain seasons. Unfortunately, when our hurricane season starts, the summer season in Europe begins. So a lot of ships change from where they are in the Caribbean and they shift to Europe. Um, those are exactly the months that we are very dead here, that we don't have the amount of ships that we would like to have. Um, some cruise lines are cruise lines like Carnival that remain in the Caribbean. However, um, that particular cruise line also has its own challenges because after COVID, they have scrapped a lot of their ships they have a lot of new ships on order. They have not been completed yet. Staffing issues. So it's something until they fully get back on track, um, it will be difficult to, to push those in those months. Um, my next question, the airport. We notice and see many achievements, but are these highlighted as much as the negativity? What is the proposal final date? Can you give us a short explanation of the plans finally pursued? to increase airlift. Um, so to increase airlift, the plans have already begun. As I mentioned, I myself was part and I led that delegation um, back in October. Myself, Ms. Mei Ling Chung from the STB, the director. I also had the CEO of the airport join us. Um, and we, I, my staff, Mr. Jerome Gums next to me was also with us at the time. Um, and we visited all these airlines. We already managed to have more daily flights from the Florida area added. Um, we have three now from Miami daily. 
um, until June, from June until the end of the year when the season kicks back in again, we have two. So this summer we will have the extra American flight from Miami, which we didn't have last year. Um, in December, the third flight will be added back, or late November, hopefully. Um, and the plan is for next year, if everything continues as it is, that we would have those three flights fully throughout the whole year. So that's an extra airlift again. Um, our campaign with Spirit Airlines also was very fruitful. It brought our airlift from two times a week to three, then to four, then within a few weeks to seven times a week, which has been going very well also. Um, the load factor on all of those flights are all over 90%, um, 95% actually and up. So the airlines themselves very happy. Um, the island also, we can see a lot of movement. Um, it's doing very well. Um, and this is something we have to keep building on. We have Southwest Airlines. We just moved their, <coughs> their base, uh, their hub to Orlando. Um, we have Frontier that just moved their hub to Puerto Rico, which also made an announcement with flights coming back again. So we have those twice a week starting in June. Hopefully by the end of summer we might have three. And by the end of the year we should be up to hopefully more than three, uh, close to five or six. So almost daily. Um, those would be 180 seats, so big jet. Um, cheap airfares under $200, you know, round trip. So it, it should do very well also to bring that clientele back to us again because we were also very popular as we like Puerto Rico. Puerto Ricans also like us. So they were also good um, clientele for us. Number four, can you elaborate a little on the plans to reduce the airfares between the countries and the islands of the kingdom? <coughs> There was a document, um, I mentioned this, I think in the last budget last year, that was already signed between the Kingdom Partners um, to ensure that this is in place. Unfortunately, it's not being upheld um, to keep the fares as low as we would like to see them between the Dutch Caribbean islands um, and between the Netherlands also. Um, that is being worked on. I myself as a minister have brought it up. Um, there is a meeting scheduled on the 14th or 15th of April coming up, um, which was a continuation to our already started discussions, um, which include also for the reduced air fares between the Dutch Caribbean territories, but also to get us back on the category one status with the um, assistance of the Netherlands, which they have been very willing to assist us. Um, number five, is there a $1 safety fee being collected at the airport? If not, can we please do so to generate the funds? The $1 safety fee is not being collected as yet. The fee is currently being discussed with the airport, whereby the airport will collect the safety fee to be paid to government. Number six, bathrooms on the Muller Bay Beach. As we all know, most of these establishments already have bathrooms, but they are there for their customers. Okay. Um, so, Anyone that frequents anywhere, if you're a customer of that establishment, they would let you use the restroom, definitely, but a regular beach goer or somebody that wants to use a shower or a restroom, um, they would not be able to do so as easily as someone using the establishment or purchasing something from that establishment. Um, also, some of these establishments, although they have bathrooms on the beach, they're portable potties. They're not really a proper restroom. Um, you know, shaky. Some people are big, like myself. It's not um, something that you would like to use. So this is why, again, the restrooms on Muller Bay. Has the location been allotted for the bathroom? Um, I have spoken with New Works, um, the, the head of New Works. There are a few locations, but we have not identified any particular one yet for that, but there is, um, there is a location, there are a few locations that we can properly put that. Will a septic be built for these restrooms? Definitely. Definitely, definitely. I am not um, one of those people that um, like to see the offal water and all of these things rolling through the streets and into our beautiful waterways, um, especially the ones that we swim in. It's not hygienic, it's not um, the proper look, and it's definitely not hygienic. So yes, a septic will be put. Will they be free, or will public have to pay for these use of the restrooms? Um, this was a question that came up with myself and the team. Um, I don't like to charge for something that we should have in place. However, then we have the upkeep of the restrooms and how will we pay for that upkeep? Um, my plan 
for that was, and my answer for that was to place some lockers also, automated lockers that are on the building. So if someone is going to swim at their own without a family member, you don't have to leave your bag on the beach, your keys, your money, you can safely put it in the locker, have a wristband in your hand, you have the key, and that fund will pay for the maintenance of the restrooms. Was there a plan for garbage bins on the boardwalk, front street, back street, and the replanting of the palm trees? Garbage bins, yes. Um, at the same time when we came up with the idea for the benches, we did say um, garbage bins are also very much needed, equally needed, because there are zero um, throughout town that are properly, you know, able to be used. The tender was put out, one bid was received and evaluated as per process, and an advice is being drafted as making its way through the decision-making process. How far along are we with the painting, the paint of the bench project? So as mentioned, um, Be The Change Foundation will be the one to spearhead that project for us, along with the STB. Um, and they are busy finalizing those talks and making the adjustments such as painting flags and the colors of the flags on the benches. And we are close to executing that. Then we have, I saw the revenues of the business license fees have increased. Can you give us an update on how long the waiting time is today for a business license and what is the backlog? For the better part of 2023, the average business license processing time was three to four weeks. The last few months of 2023, the department accumulated a delay in processing as the focus was on completing the request for the buses and taxi permits as this project with a start and end, as this was a project with a start and end date the average processing time therefore now stands at approximately five to six weeks, about one and a half month. This will be back to three to four weeks by the end of March 2024. Then I move on to the questions of MP Westcott. Williams, uh, number one, ministers speak of the National Economic Development Plan. No, the minister spoke of an economic summit, the roundtable discussion geared towards the economic development. When will there be a public transportation assessment? The first phase of the multi-phased assessment and improvement of public transportation commenced in 2022 with the publication of a new taxi tariff, which included additional consumer protections, the adjustments of the moratorium policy in 2023, and the commencement of drafting a new bus tariff in 2023. The drafting of a new national ordinance and the establishment of an authority are part of the ministry's vision for the near to midterm. How many of the things can be done for five million guilders for tourism as indicated in the budget? The projects indicated in the presentation do not reflect the budget, but the key is the frequency of executing various projects to capture and gain more market share. With five million, these projects can be executed, but with limits, is there no money budgeted for Carnival 2024? The key vision of Carnival is for STB to cross market and promote our Carnival abroad, to increase arrivals and tourism receipts during our largest cultural event of the year. There is no longer a subsidy and no Carnival budget. Post was created, an amount allocated to market Carnival. A comprehensive and substantial plan should be put in place if we are serious about the cultural event this must start right after Carnival 2024 to be executed and promoted for Carnival 2025 to increase visitors and visitor numbers. Um, Carnival, when I got into office last year, um, we did have Carnival budgeted, um, I think it was 350,000 guilders. Um, unfortunately, those were not to cover the actual expenses that Carnival needed to have covered, which are the operational expenditures. Um, it was more that money for marketing um, as they did not want any assistance in marketing, and the cultural department is, in our opinion, the one to to finance or to subsidize these um, operational expenses for cultural events, we did not add it to the budget. Status, and it was also not requested. Status of the casino last year, nor this year. Status of the casino control system. Please see an update given to Sir Martin Gaming. This one was erased to wash. Um, MP, our chair lady. The 
question five. I had a hiccup with the system and some of my stuff was not properly updated. This is one. I don't know if that one also I can send to you in writing or I can bring it back. That was the question about this casino control system. I move on to question six. Is the minister familiar with the term protect the players? Protect the player, also known as duty of care, in the context of gambling, refers to the measures taken by the regulatory authority, operators, and responsible gambling organizations to safeguard the well-being and interests of individuals engaging in gambling activities. The draft gambling ordinance and lower legislation have these interests as central tenets. Additionally, it is the industry standard practice and will also be for St. Martin that operators actively implement responsible gambling programs and contribute to the cost to address these gambling problems. So similar to cigarettes, that they have the warnings, that anything that we put up, that the casinos themselves would pay for these, these notices and these warnings, um, deterring people from gambling. Since when are two signatures lacking? and whose signature for the marketplace. So this is mentioned. Um, as I mentioned, this is overlooked. Everything is now signed off and uh, should be in our next call meeting for final approval. What is the timeline for the Harold Jack idea? The liability implication of the promotion of the Harold Jack idea. This is currently in a planning stage. Um, the design was made, it's in the planning stage. It is an, um, again, vision. What is the minister's opinion of the report called Acrobat Report? This report is related to the Ministry of Rami, but it was presented to the Council of Ministers. I personally have not seen the Acrobat Report or reviewed it. And I think that was all the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Minister Lambrix. And we go over to the members of Parliament who wish to ask anything additionally or clarifications from the minister regarding his presentation of the answers thus far. I begin with MP Lutmila de Weaver and MP de Weaver, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon to everyone. Thank you, Minister, for the answers, but I see that this is just the second uh, minister presenting and it's proven the second time around to be difficult to get the information that I requested in um, the graph regarding personal movements over the years. So the minister uh, gave me some information, which is good compared to the first one that presented here earlier on. But um, I provided, as requested, the, my questions in email um, to Secretariat, which was also shared with the ministers. So I would kindly ask please that all ministers look at my graph that I prepared for all of them to please answer the questions in regards of the change in personnel over the years for the year 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023. Very simple question. I understand that the minister uh, beforehand asked that he had more time to do it. The Minister of TEA, through you, Madam Chair, was able to give me some information, but I am still missing some. It would be easier maybe to possibly, uh, when everything is compiled, to get it in writing, but in order for me to ask for clarification and additional questions here now, I do need that information to come, or at least an estimation of when I can receive it. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP De Weaver, and we continue with MP Gums. MP Gums, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to the minister for his uh, responses to my questions. Just a clarification on um, the activities that have been done to stimulate uh, economic diversification. The minister mentioned uh, that there is currently some ongoing discussion with an investor of who's interested in doing a feasibility study. If the minister could clarify what sector uh, what economic sector then? Uh, so what business is it? You don't have to tell me the name of the business, but just what genre or field or market is, he, is the investor in? Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Gums. MP Heiliger, you have the, fl you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair, lady. I have a few clarifications and a few questions based on some articles I've read today. Um, Based on the, um, the answers from the minister, questions six and seven regarding Airbnb, the minister stated that he will be sending it, or has he already sent the questions over to the Minister of Finance? Because I would like to have those um, questions also answered. 
through you, Madam Chair Lady. Um, regarding the, the marketplace, I asked the question about it, and then the, the Chair Lady asked a more in-depth question, who exactly were the ones to sign off? So the two signatures was from which two persons for the market, marketplace? Regarding the summer camp, I didn't get much, I would like to have more clarity on it. It's a three-day event, and, you, you, and the minister through you, Madam Chair Lady, stated that he met with stakeholders. Who are these stakeholders that he met with regarding the summer campaign, upcoming summer campaign? And then the minister also mentioned that they are busy targeting high-end tourists. How? How is that? Um, what initiatives is the minister taken, taking to target these high-end tourists. And then I also have other questions um, regarding the Boardwalk Alive. Is that something that's gonna be, be, do, be, do, um, it's gonna be happening every Friday? It's a weekly event starting from when to when? I didn't, I was, I wasn't, I didn't, I'm not sure on, on, on that. It's something starting when, and is it a weekly event on Fridays, a, a weekend, when exactly? And is it just music, like the Boardwalk Fest, something that we had in the past, something similar to that? I don't know if the minister have ever heard of Boardwalk Fest. And then I also heard the minister mention the food truck village. What exactly is that concept? I just, for the first time, I'm hearing the food truck village. What exactly is the, the idea behind the food truck village? And then um, also with regards to my question regarding the public relations group, the minister stated in his, re in his response that they receive weekly, uh, monthly uh, reports. Is it possible to provide parliament with the last three monthly reports from this group? Then I have some new questions based on some developments that I've read recently. Um, as reported in the media, the Inspectorate of Economic and Transport um, Affairs announced a significant transformation, including a change in the name and the introduction of a new logo. However, during the presentation, I never heard that in the presentation from the minister yesterday, so I have like two questions pertaining to that. Could a minister through you, Madam Chair, Lady, provide some insights on this decision and its implications um, for the department's future direction? And what message would the minister like to convey to the public regarding their role in supporting the Inspectorate of Economics and Transport Affairs during the transition period? Then, I also read in today's paper, regarding PGIA's recruitment drive. It's interesting, Madam Chair Lady, that uh, PGIA is on a recruitment drive um, at a national job fair in Holland. While local qualified people that are employed, that uh, while, while firing local qualified people that were employed with it. So out of the 15 vacancies that they are now seeking to fill, how many has been advertised locally? Are these positions temporary or permanent? And please give a breakdown. How many of these positions are management positions? And what response has PGIAE received from the local job market regarding these 15 positions? How many people, staff and management has PGIAE fired or left their positions at the company in the past four years? The company claims that it claims in its release that it has hired over 50 local talents in the various positions. What are these positions? In combination with the 15 or more vacancies that it is currently seeking to fill, it means that the company would be hiring 65 people over the past months. For a company that has been functioning for more than 75 years, that has a lot of vacancies that it has been filling that to me is a lot of vacancies that it has been filling for such a short period of time. How did it operate before all these hirings? And how does it continue to function today with all these vacancies? And what are the criteria, my last question, for employment at PGIAE in terms of place or country of origin? These questions I would like to have answered. I, can, I don't mind getting them in writing, Madam Chair Lady, for the final report. I don't mind getting them in writing. Yes, I will send you the questions. Through you, Madam Chair, I'll be sending the questions to them, but I would love to have these in writing. Thank you. Thank you, MP Heiliger and MP Mingret. You now have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through you, Madam Chair, I did not get a response from the minister in regards to one of my questions. Question was, Regarding the bath, Paul, 
NBOR. Again, what is the current status of future plans for mandating bath fault and BOR courses for economic controllers so they can legally perform their duties, including issuing fines? That'll be all, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Mingret. And we have MP Heiliger who has a follow up. Just to, just to, for clarity's sake, clarifications, I don't mind, get, I would love to have them now if possible, some of the clarifications if possible, but the questions I pose, I don't mind getting those in writing. I'm sure you can respond on some of the clarification questions I'm, through you, Madam Chair Lady, if, if possible. Uh, thank you, MP Heiliger. And I too have a clarification request to the minister based on an answer given to a question, and that had to do with my comments regarding the National Economic Development Plan. So on page 47 of your budget, Minister, you have on the project and activities, diversification study, slash National Economic Development Plan, slash public transportation assessment, in 2023, a budget for 100,000. In 2024, the same thing. So I ask, where are these, whether it's something to be drafted or developed, where are they now? Where are we with them now? And your answer was, no, I haven't said that, but I wasn't going by what you said. I was going by what I read in your budget. And so I'm asking, with those matters mentioned there and a budget allocation for them, where are they now? Considering that the budget was also mentioned in 2023. So did you get started with a national economic development plan? And if you did, where are you now? Um, yes, so minister, I look at you and um, several members have placed, have made additional questions to you. Can you respond to them now, taking into account what MP Heiliger um, mentioned about her questions and not having a problem, that these be included in your written responses in the report of answers. Minister? Um, Chair Lady, I can definitely um MP Heiliger's questions, I can answer um, a few of those, but not all the rest I can in writing. I can do what I can now. Um, my apologies to MP Mingret. I overlooked that question, but I can answer that one also. Um, the question or the clarification for MP Ludmila De Weaver, um, I mentioned 2023 and 2024, or 2022 and 2023, but I do have 2020 and 21 here also. Um, I don't have a graph, but I do have the information so I can read that out. I mean, that, that's one I can answer. Um, the question for MP Gums and for yourself and the remaining of MP Heiliger, I would have to need some time to answer them unless I can send those in writing. So. If no, if no member has an uh, issue with that, then we look forward to receiving those actually in the written responses from the ministry. So when you give those answers in writing, that the additional answers will also be included. So when we get your responses, we'll have the complete okay. set of answers. If members of parliament are okay with that, then that would be. So we do in writing? Yes, okay. I'm looking to make sure that the members who have asked the questions can agree with that. This would mean, members, that we will be receiving the answers before the public meeting on the budget. Uh, MP Mingret, I note you, oh, it's okay? Okay, so we will be receiving all of the answers in preparation for the public meeting on the budget. The, the okay, so minister, I want to Thank you, and I see that the, oh, okay, we, um, yes, so, Minister, thank you. We have received your answers, and as I indicated, we'll get all of the written answers um, 
in preparation for the, yes, for the public meeting to handle this budget. Minister and support staff, I want to thank you and uh, thank you for your presentation and answers. And I will now adjourn for five minutes as we go on to the next minister to come in and respond. So the meeting is adjourned for five minutes given the change of guard, so to speak. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>
<laughs> Members of Parliament, support staff, ladies and gentlemen, we continue with our CC meeting number 15, which started yesterday. The agenda point for this Central Committee meeting of Parliament is the handling of the draft National Budget 2024 as presented by the government of St. Martin. We have had the initial introductions by all ministers, followed by questions by members of Parliament and responses given. We now continue with the Minister of Education, Culture, Youth and Sports, Dr. Randus Rudolph Samuel, who I welcome to this meeting and invite to take the floor. Minister Samuel, you have the floor. Okay, with a little technical issue solved, a battery issue, and the minister is now ready to proceed. Minister, you have the floor. Minister Samuel. It does not seem ready just yet. Let's, it's coming up. There we go. Yeah. Minister, you may proceed. Good afternoon, Chair Lady of Parliament. Good afternoon, Khrifir. Good afternoon to the members of Parliament, those sitting in the Tribune, and those listening to us in whichever way possible through the media. Madam Chair, I would have joining me um, the SG of the Ministry of ECYS and the controller of the Ministry of ECYS. This afternoon, I'm here to present the answers to the members of parliament to the questions that they have posed. And I will begin with member of parliament, Arendelle. What is the timeline for the major capital investments projects such as schools and facilities like the constructions and renovations? Madam Chair, as it relates to the 500,000 guilders capital expenditure by the CAPEX, um, in the capital expenditure for NIPA, the ministry await, is awaiting details related to the plans and timeline from the NIPA board. The funds allocated in 2023 capital expenditure budget relating to sports facilities have been partially utilized with the installation of the new artificial football field, and we are currently in the process of allocating the remaining amount for the works related to the installation of a new track. Once finalized, the installation will commence. With the renovation of John Lamini Center, the project is divided in two phases. Phase one will begin in May, of which the bid has already gone out, and phase two, will be completed when the next CAPEX expense funds become available next year, no, whenever. Coverage of the Dr. Martin Luther King School playground, this project is expected to be completed in time for the reopening of the new school in August, September 2024. The completion of the construction of the Prince William Alexander School 
phase one involves the delivery of eight classrooms at POAS. According to the planning the, from the contractor, this it will be June 2024. In regards to Mount William Hill School, the Division of Public Education will execute a request for quotation for the complete um, repair and upgrade of the Mount William Hill School, not the Martin Luther King School. This is the one on top of the hill. The scope of the work will be used to prepare a terms of reference, which the Division of Public Education will use to execute the public tender in July 2024. Equipment for SMVTS, the St. Martin Vocational School. Um, the equipment utilized for the vocational education at the school, in some instances, are over 10 years old. The acquisition of new modern equipment will guarantee that all practical subjects areas being offered will be done utilizing all the required equipment. I now go to the questions and answers of the Member of Parliament, Gums. Minister, you mentioned preserving and highlighting our culture and heritage. So I'm asking through the chair lady um, for an update on the status of the monument fund. Madam Chair, I can inform that the bidding process for the development of the monument fund has begun and is expected to close in April 2024. Once the deadline has passed, the evaluation process will take place. So next question, what is the timeline for the delivering of the results for the EGMA and IGRA projects and will Parliament receive these results? The EGMA and IGRA results are ready to be distributed to the stakeholders. The report and remediation plan are also ready to be shared. These were presented earlier this week to the World Bank and NRPB pending the approval of me, the minister, who has to yet get it presented to him, um, I will proceed and having the information shared with the stakeholders. What is the scaling plan for the internet access at the schools? Because I understand that broadband capacity has improved. However, improvements are subjective. The answer, as part of the installation of the integrated video security system, new gigabit network switches are being installed. Once this installation is completed, it will ensure that all wired network devices and wireless devices use separate virtual networks that will have their IP address pools. What has been done in the interim is that the Wi-Fi network and the wired network are on separate network routers. The network infrastructure upgrades that appear in the CAPEX spending for 2024 would remedy that situation and ensure that the public schools have a future-proof network cap capable of meeting the growing demand in the 21st century education. The following questions are the questions of Member of Parliament De Weaver, please provide an overview of employee movement from 2020 to 2023. Information should be, pre should be presented in the following years, 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023. Please see the table below of what data is requested. Madam Chair, as indicated, um, this overview have been presented to Parliament. Um, the following question, please explain why the 12.1 million, please explain why the 12.1 million has been allocated to the construction of a Charlotte Brooks and High School. Why put 12.1 million in a school instead of combining it with the performing arts space that can be utilized by not only Charlotte Brooks and students, but um, also the National Institute of Arts and the Indusu School and other groups. Uh, 12.1 million for a school that had misappropriation of funds in the past years give a better, to give a, needs to give a better comfort that is, that this investment is in safe hands. Um, Madam Chair, I can explain that the funds provided 
for a new location for Charlotte Brookson. These funds are not given to the competent authority of Charlotte Brookson, so the money is not given to them to build the school, but government will be building the school, and then the Charlotte Brookson would have a new home, and this is something that all of us in the community would like to have. The expansion of the John Larmony Center, which we, in, 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 in the text it have schools by its center, will also provide space for the performing arts schools. So we are going upstairs on the John Larmony Center and also in the going upstairs of this facility, there are more space that will become available for the performing arts schools. I now go to the questions and answers from Member of Parliament Miguet. Could the min minister elaborate on the ICT software education that has been listed in CAPEX? The answer, the funds allocated for ICT software under capital investment for the Department of Education is earmark for the implementation of a fleet management for bus operators and student tracking system. <coughs> Could the minister expand in specifics on the facilities that will be revamped by the Department of Sports? Through the allocation of capital expenditure, the football field and the track will be replaced at the Raoul Illich Sports Complex. And just to give a little elucidation, we, are, we know that the bleachers, for instance, is something that would, would need to be um, upgraded, but this is under the NRPB Trust Fund project and we await this project to be executed. The questions from Member of Parliament, Heiliger Martin. Question one. A symposium was organized in 2023 on the orange economy titled, Where Creativity, Innovation, and Growth Meet. We are of, the, are any of the outcomes of this symposium reflected in the budget 2024? Answers. The Department of Culture continues its work in its dedication towards the development of the cultural creative industries. The symposium further reinforced that the Department of Culture has been on the right track with its trajectory in the further stimulation and building of awareness of the culture creative industry. Question two, does the proposed budget align with the vision of integrating culture and tourism particularly in light of the initiatives like culture and artistry of life and the transformation of Phillipsburg into creative city. Yes, through its continuous activities, the four core pillars are continuous focus, are the continuous focus of the Department of Culture in collaboration with its stakeholders. Question three, can you provide insight into how the 2024 budget and plans reflect the significance of these sectors. Yes, since 2018, the department has been consistent in building awareness of the culture of creative industries with the following one, annual culture creative industry forum, also continued identical incidental subsidy projects, supporting the SHTA SMILE project, supporting UNESCO after-school programs, hosting cultural creative industries career fairs, the Health, Sports, and Culture Expo, introduction of the Jollification Heritage Season, the stimulation and, and funding of the, Bovod the Bovodering Dance Queens Program, production of all public days and days of observance, Feel London Overlay Cultural Education Platform, Feel London Overlay Underwater Heritage, Feel London Overlay Culture Fund, Feel London Overlay Intangible Cultural Programs, aligning the goals of the structural subsidy recipients with the four core pillars the Talent and Bears, the collaboration with the Bureau of Intellectual Properties. The fourth question. How are the initiatives aimed at enhancing cultural experiences 
for tourism and locals alike integrating. The department has dedicated its effort to change and enhance the seven public days, the national days, and the important days of observations um, from the general public and visitors alike, for example, Emancipation Day, Flag Day, the St. Martin National Cultural Parade, and the heritage season of charlification. How is the tourism brand aligned with the cultural brand, and is it therefore a national brand? Not at this time. However, there are multiple consultations within the Department of Culture and the Tourism Department in sharing of expertise and collaborations where it pertains to events and activities such as arts save lives. What measures are in place to ensure that tourism supports the preservation and promotion of St. Martin cultural heritage? This question we have sent it to the Ministry of Theater and they will answer that. Can you elaborate on how the budget addresses the mandate of defining, developing, safeguarding, and promoting the expressions of the people of St. Martin, especially within the context of the orange economy? The mandate of the department is designed to focus on this statement, what of which includes the following. The organizing and executing of national events, activities, and important days of observance. B, the supporting of cultural organizations and institutions. C, to stimulate the creative industries through the acquiring of services within cultural creative industries. And lastly, the support after school programs through the UNESCO programs. In addition to our budget post, the department focusing on the following impact goals of the Ministry of ECYS, of which are continuous development of human capital for economic growth through quality education, culture, and sport is supported and promoted. Also, required conditions are in place to achieve equal opportunities and accessibility to equal equality education to quality education, culture, and sports for all residents of St. Martin. Nation building, social cohesion, and identity development through education, culture, and sports. Following question. Regarding the four pillars of art, heritage, creative services, and media, how does the budget allocate resources to each pillar and ensure they work synergically, synergetically, to enhance, to achieve the department's objectives. There is no individual pillow accommodation within the department budget. The department's goal is to engage with them simultaneously with a focus on arts, creative services, and heritage at the current time while the focus on media is still in its infancy stage. Following question. Could you explain how the budget supports initiative aim at fostering social cohesion and dialogue, such as intangible, I rich, intangible, uh, yeah, I rich, um, and development of, I remember, intangible cultural heritage, that's it, and development of a nationwide brand, and how these tie into the broader cultural and economic goals. The goal of the department, by its very own mandate, to safeguard, promote, and develop St. Martin's intangible and tangible heritage. The department is in, has engaged in multiple activities that are aligned with economic development through the following. Awareness programs, supporting and financing developing artists, hosting forums, supporting after school programs through its various collaborations within educational institutions and cultural institutions. The very nature of the work is geared towards development, 
leading to economic success. Question number 10. In light of the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic and St. Martin's evolving identity as a nation, how does the budget address this? the need for resilience and adaptation within the cultural and creative sector? Under the theme, building home, building community, building nation, we are drawing from our organic traditional heritage that fostered the characteristics of resilience through our national days and days of observance, observations. We continuously highlight the core cultural values that define the St. Martin characteristics of resilience. Following question, how does the budget prioritize the development of infrastructure under each pillar, including aspects such as safeguarding, archiving, and signing onto international conventions and treaties? The answer, the budget supports and fosters social cohesion and dialogue by involving the community in discussions about St. Martin cultural heritage. During the course of the third and fourth quarter of the year, national consultations will be held and questionnaires will be dispersed for persons in the community to give their opinions on the elements of St. Martin cultural heritage that need to be safeguarded, revived, and to share what projects and activities need to be implemented, strengthening, and launched in schools, the community, and in the tourism sector. The department is also focused on the updating, on updating the status of its call signing onto UNESCO conventions, such as the Underwater Heritage Convention, as well as focusing on signing on to particular international lists such as Memory of the World, the Intangible Cultural Heritage List. Can you provide insight into how the budget supports initiatives aimed at promoting cultural diversity and in the inclusivity and how these efforts contribute to the overall goal of the department? Answer. UNESCO calls on policymakers and global leaders to conduct an exhaustive policy review of the creative industries, employment, social security, digital adaptation, intellectual property, education, and more. According to UNESCO, data collection, industry workers consultation, and gendered perspective can serve as a compass as we together towards as we work together towards a truly inclusive, nurturing, creative economy. It is therefore the goal of the department to execute these activities suggested by UNESCO starting from this quarter and will be continuous. The following question, Minister, considering the theoretical framework presented, how does the budget ensure adequate support for each of these sectors within the creative industry? And how does it leverage their potential for economic, societal, and symbolic value? Answer, based on the budget ledgers, combined with SOA Bay policy-based budgeting, which include the three goals. One, economic growth, continuous development of human capital, for economic growth through quality education, culture, and sports is supported and promoted. Two, education required conditions are in place to achieve equal opportunities and accessibility to quality education, culture, and sports for all residents of St. Martin. And three, cultural heritage, nation building, social cohesion, and identity development through education, culture, and sports. This is how we ensure that economic, societal, and symbolic values are fulfilled. The budget posts are tangible heritage, intangible heritage, promoting culture nationally, tracking cultural goods, cultural 
creative industry, fashion, books, bewildering dance kunst, and talent and verse. The following question, given the emphasis on culture as a driver for sustainable development, could you outline specific strategies within the budget aimed at creating decent work, reducing inequalities, and promoting gender equality within the culture and creative sector? As mentioned in the previous question, the department is using the guidelines established by UNESCO as blueprints to use as guides and how to structure to achieve set goals, which include conventions that St. Martin is co signing to. All artists within the industry are treated equally from the perspective of the Department of Culture. How does the SME training program contribute to the orange economy? Additionally, could you provide information on the number of artists who have benefited from both the grants and the training programs? Please um, understand that we need to get this answer from the SMEs people so we don't have the answer. Thank you. Minister, how does the proposed budget reflect the department's commitment to UNESCO agenda for sustainable development and arrange economy principles? And what measures are in place to monitor and evaluate the effectiveness of the budget allocation towards these goals? Madam Chair, through you, to the Member of Parliament, the government of St. Martin is co-signed to the co -signed to the Kingdom ratification of UNESCO conventions. These conventions are utilized in the development of policy documents and further strengthening of legislation. The following question, how successful were the activities conducted last year and what metrics are available to measure their effectiveness overall? The answer, the focus of the department has been to give more validity to all the national days and important days of observ observance, observations. Initially, most, these, most of these days were packed into St. Martin Day. However, in the last few years, the department has spent time changing and building awareness of each of the international days with significant participation from schools and the general public. The following question, are there plans for cultural policy and where is the identified, where is it identified in budget 2024? Through you, Madam Chair, yes, there are plans to further develop the existing cultural policy framework into a full-fledged policy. This activity is embedded in the department's plan 2024 and will be executed internally by the ministry. And the following question, the culture department has an allocated budget of, they have $70,000, but I guess this is the 130 something thousand guilders for a national anthem. What steps will be undertaken for the anthem's development? How will this process be executed? And what is the timeline? For the clarification, the items that reflect the 70,000 is not for a national anthem, but for the printing of national folk songs from Anastasia Larmony that offers books and lyrics through a discipline-based education model, which covers the, perf the performative, the aesthetics, the critical discourse and the historical discourse and will be available to the public education institutions and cultural institutions. Madam Chair, I now go over to the questions from <coughs> Member of Parliament La Cruz. First question, I've heard all the plans and achievements of the ministry. I would like to know you to elaborate on the plans to make sure that our educators are taken care of while they oversee our children. What are the plans of the ministry so that they can take care 
of their children? <coughs> the answers through you, Madam Chair. The Department of Education is currently drafting the three vacation days, the three vacation schedules starting with 2025-2026 school year. <coughs> Sorry. In this process, the department has ensured to include the feedback received from the school boards and the public and has taken measures to lengthen the summer break to six weeks. Currently, this process is in consultation stage and is expected to be concluded before the start of the upcoming school year. The lengthening of the summer of the summer break will give the teaching staff more time to recuperate and prepare for the new school year. In addition, the Ministry of Education, Culture, Youth and Sports, in collaboration with its Department of Education, has launched the Professional Development Program in 2021 to support primary and secondary school teachers in St. Martin. This initiative aimed to provide teachers with the necessary qualifications for legal teaching. With the inaugural cohort consisting, focusing right now on bachelors of elementary education and certificate of secondary education programs. And presently, six teachers from public schools are enrolled in a special education certification program. In a yeah, in, enrolled in a special education certification program. Additionally, the Department of Education is conducting research to enhance support for educators, including identifying areas for professional growth, development, le developing legal frameworks and policies for licensure and professional development, and evaluating the effectiveness of appraisals instruments. In addition, there are plans to review the function book and the remuneration of teachers. These efforts collectively strive to alleviate teachers' workload while ensuring their continued professional development and well-being. To boost employee morale, the Division of Public Education has also introduced a reward and recognition system that, perm system that permits school management to recognize their teachers in different areas, such as going above and beyond, demonstrating creativity and ideas, demonstrating team spirit, and even employee of the month. Teacher well-being has had the attention of SSSD, Student Support Services Division, for years. The 2017, 2019, 2020 Caribbean Wellbeing Conference covered teacher well-being topics, and 2019 and 2020 sessions were devoted to teachers' well-being. Teachers' well-being and self-care was some of the themes in 2023 and teacher well-being sessions were held at public and government subsidized elementary and secondary school for all teachers. These sessions focus on self-care, stress, and teacher burnout. Teachers were given tools to address their well-being, and a teacher well-being manual was developed. This is currently being edited for disbursement to all teachers at the beginning of the next school year, August 2024. This year culminated in the Student Support Services Division organizing a teacher well-being program for all teachers in November. Public and government subsidized elementary and secondary schools were closed to facilitate the attendance of all teachers. The follow-up to sessions with teachers continues in the first half of 2024 with private discussions with some teachers as a follow-up to the teacher well-being sessions held at the schools and the assessment is done. We will then meet with school boards and DPE with general recommendations on what can and should be done 
by the competent authority to address the well-being of their teachers. The following question, how many colleges in the U.S. have MOUs with country St. Martin about, the, about grants and how many students do we have for this year, 2023, 2024, making use of these? The ministry has MOU with 11 colleges and we have 384 active study financing recipients. Which are these colleges? These are Monroe College, Nova South Far Eastern, Kaiser College, Tallahassee Community College, Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University, Florida State University, Panama, Indian Hills Community College, Nebraska Kearney University, Concord University, University of the Virgin Islands, Johnson and Wales University. Following questions. Are all MOUs up to date? Answer, several MOUs are ending in 2024. However, most contain an automatic renewal clause for one year if neither party terminates the agreement. Following, how much does the government give to organizations like Nature Foundations for advice on a yearly basis? This answer will come from the Ministry of Fromi as they has an SLA with Nature Foundation. And how many students do we have now at this moment studying marine biology? We do not have any students at this moment studying biology, Mar marine biology. That's a, a specification within biology. What have, we have a few medical schools established in St. Martin. How many students have been granted scholarship? At the moment, the American University of the Caribbean is the only medical school at the moment operating in St. Martin. Currently, there are eight study financing recipients enrolled at this institution. What has it cost the community in court cases? Please divide by cases won and cases lost. The ministry has ongoing cases and we cannot ascertain at this moment um, the absolute cost. I think we have um, three, three cases. What projects could you urge the incoming government to continue? Madam Chair, I had a challenge with this question um, because um, I believe the incoming government will decide what they do. However, there is a transition document that is being developed in which everything from every ministry is documented and it is stated in the transition document what the ministry is doing and it is then up to the incoming minister or government to decide what they will do. The next question is for the member of parliament, Roseberg. Through you, Madam Chair, the first question. I notice projects in the budget addressing issues like period poverty, but what funds are allocated for addressing juvenile crime, school fights, and mental health? Is there collaboration with the justice sector? No funds have been allocated for tackling school fights or juvenile crime. However, under the trust fund managed by the UNICEF NL, the ministry is in its initial stages of developing a violence prevention strategy. Funding will be earmarked for, the, for this in 2025 also and beyond to prioritize the implementation of the strategy that will be developed. The mental health the mental health of students is addressed via subsidies to school boards and funding of DPE and SSSD. Care teams are in place in all public and government subsidized schools and they are the first line to address mental health issues of students. 
There are also referrals pathways in place so that students can be referred to entities for additional support. Students in our public and government subsidized schools have access to student care coordinators, mentors, social workers, and psychologists at no expense to them. This is all structurally funded by the Ministry of Education, Culture, Youth, and Sports via subsidy to school boards, division public education, and the Student Support Services Division. There is cooperation with some areas of the justice sector depending on the issue at hand. For instance, Court of Guardian, Youth and Moral Division of Police and Community Police Officers. Additionally, collaborations with justice is within the Interministerial Working Group on Vaping, chaired by the Ministry, which includes members of the Ministry of Justice, Tayat, and VSA. Then I come to the questions from the member of Parliament, Westcott Williams. Question one, reference is made to education reforms. What are these concretely? Answer. The education reforms budget is earmarked for the execution of the summer school program and initiatives geared towards reducing learning gaps and improving learning outcomes and for the development of strategies to improve learning outcomes in Dutch language, particularly in schools with Dutch as language of instruction. What is the status of the law program and are these still within the budget? The law program and the pre-law program are being delivered by the University of Curaçao are still operational and the budget indicated is in accordance with commitments established in the related MOUs. Question three. I see an amount divided over several organizations and the same amount for community schools. MP would like to know the program's details for the community schools that several organizations are executing. Madam Chair, the answer. The funding provided by the two, for the community schools projects was under a project budget which has been now allocated as a subsidy to each organization for the community schools. The details of the program provided by the organizations for the community will be provided in writing. Following question. The lack of repairs to boots in the Jocelyn Arndell village, we understand that this too, this question will be answered by the Ministry of General Affairs. Then we have the fifth question. Cleaning of schools from 100,000 to 800,000 enough, can the jump be explained? Madam Chair, the budget for cleaning public schools has remained consistent at 800,000 for the last five years. It has not increased or decreased. Following question, is the insurance of our students intact and running and no issues there? Madam Chair, the answers. Students are insured by the government via the student accident insurance policy, which was established in the 2022-2023 school year and is valid until the end of 2026-2027 school year. Last year, via a budget amendment in Parliament, an amount of 200,000 for Dan schools and St. Martin was taken up in the budget. At the time, Minister of ECYS indicated that he would come up with a structural program where subsidies to these schools are concerned. How did this amendment work out? And is there now a structural program or project in place? Madam Chair, in 2023, a project was developed and approved by the Council of Ministers. The project has two parts. One part is the de professional development of staff of dance institutions, 
The other part is the financial support for students of dance institutions. The latter part depends on, the, on information provided by the institutions, and that takes time. As part of the professional development, several courses were financed. In the meantime, some of the institutions developed projects in line with the budget criteria, and, there were, and, they were, and these were financed as well. For 2024, the project is to be fully operational. The following question, vaping. What did the minister say about vaping? Last year, an interministerial work group on vaping was assigned. The interministerial work group on vaping is chaired by the Ministry of Education, Culture, Youth, and Sports and consists of members from the Ministry of Justice, Teyat, and VSA. The interministerial work group will present its findings to the interministerial committee on vaping in April of this year to discuss the way forward. The assignment is for the committee to ensure the adjustment to the related national ordinance regarding the sale of cigarettes and alcohol to incorporate the definition of vaping products and include it as a restricted item for sale to minors under the age of 18. In addition, increase controls on a weekly basis at establishments, particularly grocery stores that sell cigarettes and alcohol to ensure that the sale to minors do not take place. And then I go back to the question, what did the minister say? The minister said in the meeting that with the new security um, equipment installed at the schools, smoking and vaping can be detected. And I did ask, because I like to be thorough, I did ask, was it tested? And the answer was yes. Smoking was tested, so someone smoked a cigarette and the, the alarm went off. And I said, I want vaping to be tested so that I can give a complete answer to the Member of Parliament. Madam Chair, these have been the answers to the questions of the Members of Parliament. And I await any clarification. I thank you. Thank you, Minister Samuel, for your responses to members of parliament already. I take note that there are several members of parliament who wish to address you on the answers provided, and I start with MP Marlin. MP Marlin, you have the floor. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon, colleague MPs. Good afternoon, Minister and support staff. Good afternoon to the viewing and listening audience. Minister, through you, Madam Chair, I would like to ask the following question. The John Lamini reconstruction, is this wise to do when there is not yet a plan for the auditorium next door? What are the long-term plans for that block of buildings? Has the possibility of bundling the projects been explored? And then a phase execution with the John Lamini Center going first. Think of it, qua future parking. That's the only question I have, Madam Chair. Thank, Thank you. you, MP Marlin, for your question. And I continue and ask MP Grisha Heiliger to take the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Thank you, Minister, for your answers. I just have one uh, clarification or just maybe just a question then. They, seeing that I um, mistakenly assumed that that budget post was assigned to the national um, anthem. Is there any budget post then allocated for that? Is there any plans to have um, any budget put, put aside to um, perhaps start the, the national anthem? Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Thank you, MP Heiliger Martin. And let's see if there are any, okay, we have MP La Cruz. MP La Cruz, you have the floor. Good afternoon and thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Good afternoon to the Honorable Minister and his support staff, my colleagues and those in the Tribune. Minister, I have two clarifications on the questions that I ask. 
Um, one, if I understood properly, you said that there's one medical school established on St. Martin? Operational. One is operational. Okay. And the other question, um, first I'd like to thank you for naming off the, the colleges in the U.S. that give our students grants because a lot of students that want to go away and study uh, actually were reaching out and asking these questions if there are any funds extra. So maybe if we would have that information somewhere um, in a pamphlet or that other students could go back and see this information would be a, a good idea. And then I have two questions. Do we have any plans for a public high school on St. Martin? And then the next question is, because in the budget I didn't see any um, funding for this. So the question is, are all the vacancies filled? Are all our vacancies filled in the public high schools? Do we have any vacancies open? Thank you, Madam Chair Lady. Thank you, MP La Cruz. MP Roseberg, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, good afternoon to all. Minister, thank you for um, answering uh, my question. Um, I have two follow-up questions to you, Madam Chair. Um, about the subsidy to the school board, um, too often I have seen that young students in St. Martin are being sent home by schools, some of which receive subsidy from the ministry, as we can see in the budget. And I'm interested in understanding the ministry's current stance and actions regarding the frequent instances where especially our black young um, students are being sent home are simply suspended simply because their hair is deemed a few inches too long. Um, this particularly concerning given the fact that um, education is compulsory. Um, and I would like to know if there's a current policy in place to tackle this matter or if there's a policy in the make to tackle this matter. The second question, um, also in regards to, um, this is in regards to receiving subsidies, what is currently the time frame for receiving um, subsidies through the ministry after you have um, submitted the request? Because I understood that it can take some time and I would like to know what the current time frame is. Uh, for especially sport federations to receive requested subsidies. Those are the questions, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Roosberg. Minister, before I give you the floor to respond, allow me to add some primarily clarifying questions to those posed by my colleagues. Minister, I note, I have taken note, that with respect to the community school program, that that information, as this program is being executed by the different schools and school boards, that that will be provided in writing. I also noted that with respect to the festival, the Jocelyn Arndell Festival Village and the repairs of the boots, that that will be, the answer to that question will be provided by the Prime Minister. Then I want to come to, so I have noted those two items, then I come to the issue of the dance schools. And I want to thank the minister for, based on the amendment that was made to the budget, for having executed that program. I've taken note that in 2024, the program will be fully operational. And I would like to know from the minister, based on the particular budget post, what part of that is for the dance schools? So what part of the budget, because I heard the minister mention not only that program, but several others in one breath, so to speak. So I want to know what part of it is for the dance school. Mm -hmm. Minister, thank you for the information on the vaping and tackling vaping, especially amongst our youth. And there is an inter interministerial work group. And I understand that report will be in April of this year, 
And then the minister mentioned weekly controls. Are those taking place now? So are no, okay, that's disappointing news. But um, so the weekly controls is something to come is my question to the minister in connection therewith. I was hoping it was already in place. And then this equip equipment installed at schools to detect smoking. And the minister's question to the schools is whether it can, and if it does not, it should also be able to detect vaping. So this equipment is already installed at schools based on what? So with that, I mean at how many schools? Is it a pilot? Is it all high schools? Is it, so what is this? What is the total overall program of equipment having been installed at, at schools? Which of course I, I applaud, but I would like to know, is it at some schools, one school, all high schools, a few high schools? So if the minister can give a little more information where that is concerned. And Minister, that would be it. And we have um, both MP, firstly, let me give the floor to MP La Cruz. Both MP La Cruz and MP Rosework would like to follow up with something with the Minister. So MP La Cruz, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Minister, I forgot a question. Um, I think you mentioned that the government gives um, some type of scholarship to students that want to study at the UOC. The University of Curacao. Did I understand that? Because, and maybe you could elaborate a little more. Could you elaborate a little bit more on how that process goes? Because um, many, and myself, have paid um, tuition and all our books for the law course that is being given. So is the law course part of it, and what is government actually giving to the students in the form of a tuition. Thank you, MP La Cruz. MP Roseberg, you have an addition as well? Um, yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, in connection to the subsidy, uh, I would like to make it clear uh, why the question was asked, because I understood that the swimming team um, needs to leave next week, and up to now, they haven't received the um, subsidy for that um, tarifta. So that's why, um, if that can be clarified, and also um, in connection to my question um, in regards to addressing the uh, juvenile crime, where it was um, reacted to that there, through the trust fund in the future, um, 2025, the violent prevention strategy. But then my question is, seeing that we have so many school fights at this moment, and it does not seem to be under control. What is the short-term solution to tackle that matter? Um, I would like to have that clarified. That's it, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Roseberg. And Minister, I think we're now at a point where you can commence with your responses. Are you ready to immediately go into those responses? Would you like a few minutes, Minister? Madam Chair, there is a request for 10 minutes, and then we can answer the question. Okay, surely. The, this meeting is going to be adjourned until a quarter past five. So that's a little more than the 10 minutes requested, I know, but we'll go until, so the meeting will be adjourned until 5.15, a quarter past five, meeting adjourned.
Members of Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. We continue the Central Committee meeting of Parliament, Central Committee meeting number 15, handling the draft budget for the country for 2024. We have had the presentations by the ministers, questions by the members of Parliament, and we are now in the session of ministers responding to the questions by members of parliament currently with us, who I welcome back as well, is the minister of ECYSA and his support staff, Dr. Randa Samuel. Minister, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, I will proceed to answer the follow-up questions, clarifications from the members of parliament. The first question is from Member of Parliament, Malin. The John Larmini reconstruction, is it wise to continue with the plans considering the area next door with the sports auditorium and the future parking? Madam Chair, as answer to the question, the upgrading of the John Larmini Center has been in the making for a number of years and the plans will now be executed as this project is considered under capital in investment. Um, one of the things that we need to understand with this plan is that most of the dance schools have been asking for many years for space where they can do, um, and you, you see it today um, also in some of the questions. And for that reason, it was one of the good things to make this project um, you know, become a reality. Additionally, the vision for John Lamini Center includes a full manifestation of, conver of converting German John Lamini Center into an incubator for the arts. Once the, se the, the second floor has been expanded, the vision for the courtyard will be turned into a mini theater and an incubator where students would focus on training as lighting technicians, sound engineering, and sound technicians set designers. Um, the question also in relation to um, the Charlotte Brookson School where it asked, um, would the other dance schools be able to use the facilities? I believe that government would have to make sure that when government build a school, these type of arrangements are in place. The following question is the question from Member of Parliament, Martin. Is there any budget allocated for the national anthem, seeing there is none at the moment? There is no budget specifically, specifically allocated for the national anthem. However, there is budget of 229,000 guilder for cultural heritage, which could be used for this project. Additionally, I would like to inform Parliament that the Ministry of Education, Culture, Youth, and Sports have also all have indicated to this Parliament before that the making of a national anthem is a joint effort between the Ministry of General Affairs and the Ministry of ECYS, and including other ministries most naturally. Then, Madam Chair, we have the question for Member of Parliament, La Cruz. There is one medical school operational on St. Martin, and um, there is two established. I understand the question from the Member of Parliament, if the other school is already operational, I understand it is not operational but established. The second question, can information be provided on, for instance, a pamphlet regarding the MOUs of the universities where students can go to? Um, as I understand, Madam Chair, this information is available on the portal by the Division Study Finance. Are there any plans for a high school, for a public high school on St. Martin? Uh, I would like to 
remind the member of parliament that government has one high school and that high school is the St. Martin Vocational School. There, yes. Um, and if we recall, I think it's on the 12th of April, I sent a memo to the parliament in regards to a motion of this parliament in where it has been decided to separate the students at the St. Martin Vocational School and then we would have a PSVE school, which is a government PSVE school, and also a secondary school for special education. Because at this moment, we only have a primary school for special education. So then you would have a PSVE school for government, which is a secondary school, and also the the special education school would be a secondary school. But at the moment, we do have a secondary school for public, um, and that is the St. Martin Vocational School. Are all our vacancies filled in the public schools? No, all vacancies are not filled. And it is, it is challenging to say you will fill all the vacancies because there are different things taking place. Some people go on um, on, on, on leave, on, on, on pension. Some persons stop at the, at the end of the year, and then you rehire. It's a, like a, a revolving um, thing that is happening. Government gives scholarship for students studying at UOC. What is government giving to students um, in the forms of scholarship in regards to the particularly the law school? Okay, so that answer is still coming. Then I go to the questions from the member of parliament, Roseberg. The subsidies, subsidies to the school boards. Too often students are sent home from school. What is the ministry's current stance on our black young student sent home because of the length of the hair? First of all, Member of Parliament Reusberg, I will tell you, when I was going to school, I had the biggest Afro, I believe, and the best one ever. However, um, as the, yes, I, I had the best Afro, and a long Afro pick. However, um, <laughs> yeah, it was years ago. However, I do understand the issue at hand, and there are different, let's say, approaches to it. Uh, the school board is claiming that when you register as a student at the school, they have rules that you have to abide with until you leave. And I think that is the challenge at hand. The school board is a competent authority. They do receive subsidy from the government, and that subsidy is for carrying out education. But the subsidy is not tied to those different rules. One of the things that we have been able to do in the last two, three years is we have brought changes to education supervision. And what we do, we notice that there were some, some laws, some rules or articles in secondary school um, law that was not in that, yeah, they, they were in the primary school law and not in the secondary. So what we did it was combine the two which is an upgrade and an overhaul so that they can synchronize better. And I believe in the future, more of this will happen to include other items. So, um, and, and I can recall for those of you that remember during the COVID years when um, we could not enter into one of the private institutions, which was an education institution, that has now been, um, put into the change that now the Minister of Education can enter to those institutions when the law, the draft law is completed. So you would see that when it comes to Parliament. Um, then we have the following question. What is currently the time frame for receiving subsidies for, from the Ministry after you submitted a request? 
um, especially for sports um, foundations. The swimming team has to leave next week. The time frame for pros the time frame for processing a subsidy request is two months, and this is based on the subsidy ordinance. And once the request is processed, the organization will receive an official response indicating whether or not they were successful. The, the request that you spoke about for the swimming team, uh, I am looking at it because I did get a phone call yesterday and I told the person I will follow up and see what the situation is, okay? What is the short-term solution to tackle school fights? Um, I'll be straight with you about this. Um, if your child is underage and it damages someone's vehicle, the parent has to pay. If your child is underage and it damages another child, there's psychological damage, physical damage, then let the parent pay. At the moment, there is a lot of focus on the child. I think we should also look at the parent. While I will fight every day to make sure that every child is in school, there is a challenge with children fighting. Because when children are fighting, you have to move them from that environment. So if a child fights in one school and you say, okay, good, I will put the child in another school, you get the message that the family members of the, the child that was fighting is in the other school waiting for that child to come there. So the moment you put the child over into the other school, you create another situation that is unsafe, not only for the child, but for the school. So in St. Martin, we need to really decide what is right and what is wrong. And it also has to come from home. Children are to go to school to learn. And if you are going to school to learn, you would not be fighting. I'm not saying that things cannot happen, but it, it, has, to, it has to reach home. Home has to be aware that there are consequences. And yet, I will fight for every child to get an education. Whether the child fought already or ever, I will try to fight for the child to get back into school. This is not a, a game or a political answer. Parents have to take responsibility of the actions of their child. I saw a video where a child runs through a supermarket and just fall in its bag. That, that can't be right. And when you call the parent, the parent is shocked because the same parent gave the child pocket change to go to school to buy what it wants. So we, we, we need to be straight up with this. Home has to take responsibility also. Thank you. Um, MP Westcott, community school program that will be submitted, yes. The festival village information will be submitted by the Ministry of Asset, based on the budget post, what part of the budget is for the dance school? The dance institutions benefited from the Vaudering Dance Kunst. The bottom line is all the schools benefit, which is true funding that is sent directly to them for their teachers and for their students' upgrade. Additionally, the institutions are direct recipients of funding when they request. So it is also important that they do request. Are there weekly controls taking place? No. And um, I know that the assignment includes, um, includes um, let's just say that controls take place, whether it's on a weekly, a biweekly, or daily basis. So at the moment, no controls are taking place on vaping as yet, and I believe the outcome of the findings and the legislative modifications will dictate in which direction that goes. Number five, the equipment to detect smoking and vaping, this equipment is at the public schools only. And as I can recall, I believe that there might be two schools where the installations yet has to go, but um, the other 
public schools. This is the upgrade that we have. And we have been having um, issues with break-ins, with robberies, with issues with smoking. So we looked for a, a device, a, a, a program that will assist also with if a stranger walks into the school, in the future it will be able to detect hey, that person is not from this school. So it is an upgrade to protect our students and also to make sure that schools are safe. I thank you. Minister Samuel, thank you for your responses. Any final remarks for the minister before we go over to the next minister and ministry. I don't see that being necessary at this time. So, Minister, I want to thank you for your answers. We look forward as the Central Committee meetings continue towards the public meeting to handle the budget that we receive your answers, of course, in writing, as well as those that have not yet been answered for those to be included in your written answers. So minister and support staff, thank you once again and have a wonderful evening. I adjourn for five minutes as we then go over to the next minister to provide answers. Meeting adjourned for five minutes.
Members of Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, good evening and welcome back as we continue in Central Committee meeting number 15, handling the draft 2024 budget of the country, St. Martin. We continue with the ministers providing answers to questions posed by members of Parliament as we have just finished with the Minister of ECYS, we now have Minister Erion who will be providing the answers asked regarding the Ministry of Vromi. Minister Erion is deputizing for the Minister of Vromi who, as indicated at the beginning of this meeting, cannot be at the meetings and will be out for some time, for a few more days, I believe it is. So we welcome Minister Irian, and I invite him to immediately go into providing answers to the questions that relate to the Ministry of Vromi. Minister Irian, you have the floor. Good evening, Madam Chair. Good evening, Khafir, MPs, and those, the public viewing. I'll start first with a question posed by MP De Weaver. MP De Weaver, your question required a table, so the, the table has been sent, or will be sent to the Parliament for your viewing. Question two was in regarding the 17 million guilders for the waste plant. The 17 million guilders will focus mainly on expansion of the network and house connections in the area where there are existing sewage lines and also the upgrading of the sewage plant on the AT Illage Road. For the other area, as mentioned, where there are no sewer lines in the main roads, major capital investments will have to be undertaken in order to mitigate running sewage water on normal roads. In addition to that, in the current capex, we are allocating a portion of that to deal with some, not sewage, but some lines that lead to a sewage in Kobe. In the intermediary phase, the Ministry of Rami will continue with the reinforcement or the enforcement of the applicable rules and laws to, together with the Ministry of Justice and VSR, and I'll also mention TIAT, because we also have issues with hindrance permits or business licenses given out with other hindrance permits, and these cause other, other issues in the long term. The next question was regarding how the persons who are currently dumping raw sewage in the waters and roads be controlled. The Ministry is aware of this ever-growing concern of the sewage problem. In order to effectively address these concerns, the Ministry of Rami has approached other ministries and stakeholders for joint assistance in combating this dilemma. In addition to the Department of Inspection, is in the final phase of completion of the fine book, whereby controls will be executed and persons will be fined for committing this violation. Next question was regarding the garbage containers on Great Bay Beach. In reference to your question relating to garbage on Gravy Beach, in 2024, with an increased number of beachgoers, there's a heightened need for clean, clean efforts. The Ministry of Rummy is proactively enhancing the cleanliness of our popular beaches, including that of Great Bay, Muller Bay, and Simpson Bay. Through the regular maintenance of bins and sand, collaborating with the Ministry of Tiat, efforts will focus on removing obstacles like storage bins on the beach, chairs to facilitate safe and efficient cleaning procedures. Additionally, the Ministry will procure additional vehicles to bolster contract supervision and enforcement measures. Thank you. What are plans to mitigate traffic jams? I believe that, yes, I'll now move on to the questions posed by MP Mingret. What are plans to mitigate traffic jams? There, there's a road network investment plan which consists of the realization of major new roads known as links. Due to a lack of major capital funding, these new links known as link three, four, and five, link three, four, and six, which will contribute towards traffic congestion, has not been materialized. The design plans have been drafted pending, to the, pending the cost to cover the execution phase, and in this case, link four and six. The Ministry of Romney will support Eswa Bay with establishing the road fund that would contribute significantly towards the realization of these long outstanding links and upgrading of a road network. The Ministry of Rami also believes that not just roads will be the solution to the traffic jams at St. Martin, but also in collaboration with the Ministry of TIA, the looking of a public transportation system, a proper 
public transportation system and laws to be put in place to be able to tackle the issue of the traffic jams on St. Martin. Next question was in relation to traffic studies. Various traffic studies have, have been commissioned in the recent past, and the ministry is aware of this. I'll also like to mention from my other hat as Minister of Finance, I myself, you know, I also live here and deal with probably the worst traffic from the St. Peter's area. Um, also looked at um, different traffic studies also. We also had a meeting uh, with the ministry, um, with Justice regarding the traffic jams. And we looked at old reports also and like one of the reports, for example, stated having a, in Kobe, making Kobe, for example, one big roundabout, so it becomes two lanes. So that's something I heard about when I, when I just came back home, I think in 2014 or 2015. So I personally called, um, I personally had a meeting with the justice at that time and Mr. Kurt from, from the Ministry of Rummy, and we looked at the, that possibility again. And we then had decided to act, to do a pilot project again, but we needed time to plan out because you, you have to educate the public on this and you know, have the public, the tourists, you have to create a signs because then it'll be one whole runabout from as soon as you go down the hill, come around the bridge and come back over, and then the side roads in between, then we come up and down one way, one way um, streets. Then you would then have two cars at all times flowing, <coughs> and then one bearing off to the left and one bearing off to the right. Because traffic is not just about vehicles, it's also because of humans. First, every time a, a car stops, right, you create unnecessary especially, you create a, a, a backlog, a traffic jam. So it requires not just a ministry of um, Rummy, it requires actually a government-wide government perspective on how we're going to tackle these um, go, going forward. Next question was regarding Brummy investigated the stoplights um, by the school districts. The area in question where the majority of the schools are located is known as School of Sac with the one way in the one way out traffic, placing stoplights in this area. In question will not yield much success due to a lack of alternative route routes for outbound and inbound traffic in the area. The ministry will con continue to collaborate with other ministries such as Mekki, Tiat, and Justice in seeking solutions not limited to, as I mentioned just now, infrastructure provisions. The realization of link six, which is the link uh, from Bimont Hill to, to Dutch Quarter, uh, has also been a key concern for the Ministry of Rummy, and we continue to look at finalizing that process. We now move on to MP Melissa Gums. MP asked for clarity if it was 18 or 80 million. I did clarify yesterday, it's 18 million. MP said she was surprised by this move for the vessel. The ministry has, a, the ministry has had discussions with Nature Foundation whereby it was indicated that, that they do not have the necessary manpower power and resources to execute enforcement controls of illegal activities that falls under the inspectorate of Rummy. Other entities were also approached to assist with complaints received. However, we have also faced with a lack of tools to execute controls. On a whole, the Ministry of Rummy receives complaints that, that cannot be addressed or enforced due to lack of tools necessary, and this is one of the tools. In addition, the Department of Inspection will be commencing an internal restructuring of the staffing and the tasks to be executed to properly address the enforcement controls of illegal activities. In addition, as I mentioned yesterday, that the vessel will also be used by the Ministry of Tiat for the Maritime Department. Next question was regarding the co-financing of the sewage network. Yes, the 45 million gillers MP includes the co-financing. It, it consists of 27 million gillers being loaned from the Netherlands and then plus 80 million gillers allocated from the trust fund. And now move on to the questions by MP Heilige Martin. Did the minister ever review the presentation by Acrobat X? If so, can he provide Parliament with an expert opinion? The Ministry of Rummy did receive the report as indicated previously, and the relevant department is busy reviewing it and will render an advice in the coming weeks. How many board members are presently on the Housing Foundation Board? and has the government assigned its required board representatives. The supervisory board has five members of which two recently appointed by the SBOD of the Housing Foundation. 
Next question was regarding the lack of maintenance uh, from the foundation and the, for the, and the foundation having sufficient funding to carry out its required maintenance. The Housing Foundation has a three-year maintenance plan. Phase one and two have been executed and completed in 2023. The third phase is scheduled to take place as soon as the alternative funding is obtained. The next question, oh no, the follow-up the follow question was regarding renovations. With the establishment of the new PA, the housing assistance will also contribute to financial needs of housing, sustainable and maintenance of units. Next question, there have been complaints regarding the completion of the towers, or the, the renovation of the towers, in particular leaks the MP mentioned. What, has hap what is the proposed solution for this and who will be funding these solutions? All the complaints will be addressed by the contractor upon arrival of the respective materials required. Next question by the MP. How far along has the government been completion and signed the performance agreement? The new performance agreement between the Housing Foundation and Government of St. Martin and the Ministry of Romy is in the final stages. Legal Affairs and the Housing Project team are in the final discussion so that this document can be sent for approval. Next question was regarding the financial impact for government based on the new agreement. Once the new performance agreement has been established, there will be an increase in the housing assistance that is provided that is provided from the government to the tenants of the Housing Foundation. In anticipation of this, the Ministry has already increased the housing assistance from 300,000 guilders to 728,000 guilders. The Housing Foundation will have to apply on an annual basis with a substantiated request for housing assistance needed as this will fluctuate based on the required housing rental assistance. Next question. In order to develop, sorry, the question is, has the government established its housing policy? In order to develop a comprehensive housing policy, housing experts have recently been recruited to support this complex policy. The policy is in the early stages and will take into account previous information that has already been worked on in the past by the ministry and other stakeholders. MP said that the last two budgets increased the housing subsidy to 720,000 guilders, however, this, was, this value was not transferred to the Housing Foundation. The Housing Foundation has been receiving the previous amount of 300,000 guilders as per the old agreement in anticipation of the new performance agreement. As was previously mentioned, the Ministry has budgeted for the anticipated increase in the housing assistance that will be requested once it is signed and agreed. Has the subsidy policy been established? The new performance agreement will outline how the housing assistance is effectively managed until a policy is established. Has an operational audit within the last four years been completed to ensure effective and efficient services to the Housing Foundation, to, to the tenants and the population at large who have requested housing for so long over many years? If so, what are the results? Annually, the financial, corporate governance, and operational integrity are, are audited by an external auditor hired by the supervisory board. In addition to this audit, a housing report and management report as a statute, statutory re required by the performance agreement with the government of St. Martin. Reports on the HOPE 1 and the HOPE 1 and HOPE 2 projects are executed on a quarterly basis. Respective reports are being submitted to government and respective institutions annu annually. It must be mentioned that the relationship between the Housing Foundation and government has drastically improved over the last few years, which has led to a willingness to improve on many aspects, which can be seen from the new performance agreement that is in the final stages of approval. Does the government have a plan for housing development to address the housing shortages? If so, this, if so, is this addressed in its budget and the projected budget for the next four years? The government can stimulate the housing market and, and address the housing issues at hand through development of the upcoming housing policy, the continuation of previous housing development projects, and the purchase of land for development of homes, which is in the CAPEX. This can be seen in the capital expenditure for land purchases and now move on to the questions posed by MP Rosenberg. Rosenberg? Berg? Um, Berg? 
based on the budget, six million capex investment in resurfacing in resurfacing main roads. What is a what is the place to mitigate the groundwater problems on the most of these roads? Has this been budgeted? If so, where? With the upgrade of the main roads projects, the Ministry of Brumby will be including the drainage provisions in order to mitigate the ongoing problems at hand with groundwater. Drainage provisions has been included in allotted operational and capital expenditure budgets. And now move on to the questions posed by MP Westcott Williams. the new performance agreement between House of Foundation and government is in the final stages as was previously mentioned. What is the status of the vendors on the pond film? This question has also been sent to the Ministry of TF for Handling, it says here, and he has answered already. Regarding the Acrobat report, as mentioned previously, the report has been reviewed by the Ministry of Rummy. The, the MP acts also whether the Central Bank of Curacao, St. Martin, have taken the government of St. Martin or whoever to St. Martin to court with a request to have the structures at Malabay removed. The government of St. Martin has no outstanding court cases with anyone concerning the removal of structures on Malabay. In fact, the last court case related to this beach proved that Malabay Beach is indeed owned by the government of St. Martin. In regard to the Civil Code Book 5, and next question by the MP, in regard to the Civil Code Book 5 and what it states in reference to the beaches, restriction of public access to the beaches belonging to the country through alienation, encroachments, use, or otherwise, requires special permission, the MP said. The answer, under St. Martin Civil Code, the government owns the beaches. These beaches stretch from water's edge all the way to where the natural sea sand stops. The Ministry of Rummy is responsible for managing the beaches. Special permission may be granted by the Ministry of Rummy as it pertains to ownership or usage of the beach on St. Martin via national decree or rental agreement. Madam Chair, that will be all the questions posed. Thank you, Minister Irian, for presenting those answers on behalf of the Ministry and Minister of Vromi. I do have a member of parliament who wishes to um, react to those answers, and I give the floor to MP Roseburg. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you for the clarification, of, uh, for the questions answered, Minister. Uh, my name is Roseburg, just in case. Ask, um, in connection to my question, could you please clarify um, which roads are on the list for drainage, upgrade, and our implementation? I thank you, Madam Chair. I thank you, MP Roseburg. I now give the floor to MP Gums. MP Gums? <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. Okay. I just uh, thank you, Minister, as well for the answers. So just, just a comment, not really a question or a request for clarification on the matter of the, the vessel. So it's, I think, over the years, Nature Foundation has also been requesting the ability to be able to be empowered to enforce um, protections in the marine pr protected area, for example, the Man of War Shoal Park, um, and other areas, including the lagoon and our waterways. But so why not that route, I think, uh, is what I'm asking. Why not just, you know, um, empower Nature Foundation to actually act in a, in a manner that other nature reserves, et cetera, are able to act uh, in other uh, countries. So that's more of a comment um, on, on, I guess, this decision or this thought that the ministry is having. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, MP Gums. I don't see any other member requesting the floor. Um, minister, with those questions or clarifications asked by members of parliament, I Thank you for the answers. And Minister, I, in connection with the issue that I asked regarding the civil code, of course I know what it says. Where I was leading to was in that particular article, of course the beaches are assumed to be public domain, and it mentions that in doing anything on the beaches, that needs to be done by national ordinance. This is where I was going. And how does this compare to 
what is happening or has happened on, for example, Mullet Bay Beach. That's where I was going with the matter of it having to be done, the exemption to do something on the, bit, on the beach having to be done by Lansford ordinance, national ordinance. That's what I wanted to hear from the ministry. How, how, how does that align with permission being granted, whether rental or otherwise? That's where I was going with that, number one. Number two, the issue of the central bank requesting the clearance of the Mullet Bay Beach is something that was said here in Parliament. It was said here in Parliament. So my question is, was, that, was, was it misspoken? Is it not so? Did they not ask the court, did they ask the government to take everything that is on the beach off? That was mentioned here in Parliament. And that's why I keep asking, did the Central Bank of Curacao and St. Martin or someone empowered by them ask either the courts or government to clear the Mullet Bay Beach of the structures that are currently on the beach? That's my question. And if it is so, who asked it? Because if that was asked, then that would mean that uh, the owner, the manager, whoever they are of Mullet Bay, is actually disputing the ownership of the beach being public domain. So is, is that so? Who did it? What did they do? Did they go to courts? Did they ask for it in courts? Did they send a letter to the government asking? But it was said here in Parliament that the central bank of Curacao and St. Martin went to court to ask that the structures currently on Mullet Bay Beach be removed. It was stated that that request was denied by the court. And I am asking for clarification on that request on the basis of what was it done in the first place. And I would like to see the, the um, decision of the court in that respect. I hope, it, I hope it is clear what I'm asking and also, and that's why I tie it in to Article 26 of Book 5 of the Civil Code of St. Martin. So, Minister, if you can um, clarify that for me, please, then, um, yeah, along with the other questions asked by members of, um, of Parliament. Minister, you can immediately go into those matters. Minister Irian, on behalf of the Ministry of Romi, you have the floor. For MP Roseburg, and regarding the roads, can we send you, send you the list and write anything that will be better? And regarding the comment by MP Gums, yes, I, I also agree with your thinking. That's also a discussion that we've had in terms of Nature Foundation, but also um, St. Martin Pride. How can we use them more, um, let's say not, not like how we use them now, for example, but as SLA maybe, just include them more in certain decisions. Um, and that, has, that was a discussion we had a few months ago, actually. So yes, that's something the ministry is looking into. These two bodies, I think I would, I would even say the strongest bodies when it comes to the voice of nature um, Nature Foundation, St. Martin Pride, we have looked into include them in this, at, at the very least in discussions going forward on certain items, or even advice. Um, I guess MP, um, Chair, we can, send, we can get the, the bonus uh, and have it submitted to Parliament. And um, yes, the entity, so I believe at that time it was a sun resort at that time was taken over by the, the central bank in a sort of a, a management uh, situation, but now it's back under sun resorts. Was in dispute in terms of um, a property, an entity that was, in their opinion, encroaching on the land that was under um, their watch. Um, there was a court case. I believe, the, I believe they lost that court case. So I'll, I'll get confirmation. But yes, that was a discussion. Um, and they just want, and they said they, they, that they just want clarity, um, and they're still looking for clarity, seemingly. Um, but the court said that 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 was government land, so I'll, let's get confirmation. But yes, there was a dispute that they believe that this entity 
that had a structure was partially on what's supposed to be under the 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 watch of Malibé, and that would then concern their concern then becomes that then Mal the value of Malibé then will be encroached upon. But we will send the we can send the bonus. Thank you, um, thank you, Minister, for those responses. And MPs, no, I went to ask MPs. Are there any other or further questions for MP for Minister Irian on behalf of the Ministry of Rumi? Minister, that does not seem to be the case. That any MP has any further questions for you for the Ministry of Romi. So, Minister, with a note that the with a note that the the verdict, the judgment of that particular court case will be provided to Parliament. And was there anything else that the Minister has to send in addition to his written answers? MP Roseberg as well. Okay, so that will um, that will be part of the minister's written responses as we go towards the public meeting. Minister, then I want to I want to thank you. I want to thank you um, and your support staff for the responses regarding the Ministry of Romi, and I adjourn for five minutes to allow us to do the change over to another minister and ministry. This meeting is adjourned for five minutes and I thank the minister. Meeting adjourned.
Members of Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. This reopening of the meeting is just to announce our half hour break that we will have. In other words, the meeting will continue with the Minister of Finance at 6.45 in the next half an hour. So this adjournment is now to just make it clear that the meeting will be adjourned for 30 minutes and we will be back at 6.45. Meeting adjourned. Okay.
We're going to get started, guys. <clears throat> Members of Parliament, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to this continuation of Central Committee meeting number 15. The Central Committee meeting that started yesterday and it regards the handling of the draft budget 2024 as presented to Parliament by the government of St. Martin. We are now in the part of this meeting where the ministers are coming and responding to questions posed by members of parliament yesterday. We have had several ministers who have done so already during the course of today, and we now have up the following minister, that is the Minister of Finance. Minister Artwell Erian is with us along with his support staff, who we say welcome to. And I immediately invite Minister Erion to give the, provide answers to questions posed by members of parliament. Minister Erion, you have the floor. Good evening again, MPs. Good evening again to the viewing public. I'll start right away immediately with the questions posed by MP Arundel. What measures will be taken, in, taken to increase government revenues and reduce expenses? As it pertains to increased revenues, more collection officers were recruited, enabling the extension of our outreach program to more delinquent taxpayers. Additionally, a rigorous monitoring of assessment expiration dates for non-payment facilities um, prompted action. Oversight of payment arrangement ensures compliance while heightened investment in infrastructure such as road paving stimulates eco economic growth. This growth supplements revenues as businesses accrue greater profits and individual earning, earn high incomes, thereby leading to an upsurge in tax receipts. As it pertains to reduce, exp reduce expenses, in general, the overall expenses of government are not showing a decrease. Nonetheless, there's a reallocation of funds taken place on individual budget lines to address priorities set by government. And as was mentioned before in our presentation, you, you can see that these efforts have been paying off because in areas where um, revenues did not increase, tax did increase. So it shows also that these efforts are paying off. And in the first couple of years of, gov of our gov government, so 2020, 2021, 2022, and especially due to the pandemic at that time, the government initiated a lot, a lot of, of cost reduction efforts, which were um, gas, uh, mobile, among others. So we don't see a lot of, of cost reduction efforts now in terms of um, from 2023 to 2024, but we did a lot of that in the, the first three years. The goal of this government now was to continue to find ways to increase revenues and not continue to decrease um, on the government expense. And of course, there's all the areas where we can improve. Are there any plans to allocate extra funds towards paying out justice workers? Currently, uh, regarding the justice workers, as we mentioned before, there is the money is there to pay them out. We have budgeted for this for 2024 and beyond. So there are no changes needed. To there are no changes needed to be to be implemented. What loans are included for repayments in 2024 budget, and how do these relate to COVID loans received by, from the Netherlands? As indicated in the elucidation book on page nine, there is a forthcoming repayment obligation of 73.5 million guilders scheduled for 2025. However, the repayment does not pertain to any loans received in relation to COVID-19. Are there any major risks or uncertainties mentioned that could impact the revenue or expenditure for projections in the 2024 budget? On page five in the elucidation book outlines the anticipated risks pertaining to the budget impacts in 2024. Furthermore, within the policy 
paragraphs of our ministry's various risks are mentioned, each related to the specific function and responsibilities of respective ministries. And now I'll move on to the questions posed by MP Messina, MP Messina who definitely emphasized the word outgoing government at least 20 times. Um, states here, IMF report shows a debt bill of 1.4 billion. It is also stating that the total debt from 2020 has increased due to liquidity support. Debt according to the government is 980 million. Where's the difference coming from? In the IMF report, MP, the projections take the submitted past budgets into consideration where we were expecting higher deficits during the pandemic. C. Martin had requested liquidity support for an amount of 628 million guilders. These were the deficits initially budgeted for uh, from 2021 to 2022, but C. Martin only received 316 million guilders. We assume that the IMF is still using the budgeted amounts, therefore we can see a difference in the total debt seeing that the government is using the actual amounts. To clarify, the actual debt of St. Martin is the amount as stated in the budget of St. Martin, not in the IMF report, which was based on projections. As such, there is no major decrease in the debt of St. Martin. In the last years, the debt of the country has increased. The saldo and interest in the Model E shows the following. Uh, 2022, saldo 840 million, interest 11.2 million, 2023, 888 million, interest 30.7, 2024, saldo 992.3, interest 24.6, 2025, 909.8, saldo, interest 26.1, and 2026, 903.1, saldo, and interest 25.1. This table will be submitted in the report. The, incre the, interest, the increase in interest in 2024, as stated in my presentation, is due to the interest on the COVID loans, which were agreed upon in 20, November 2023. The zero interest liquidity loans were refinanced in 2023 at 3.4%, and the full interest effect shows up in the 2024 and in future years. The 3.4% of loan of a loan of 360 million amounts to approximately 11 million per year. Higher revenue in the following question. Higher revenues are expected as we could see an increase in tax revenues in 2023. How realistic is that? Is it that we collect 70 million more in revenues in 2024? Between 2023 and 2024, revenue had surged by 59 million guilders as shown in my presentation. Various income sources, including taxes, are presently, presently estimated by directly correlating them with the GDP and economic <laughs> expansion. Hence, based on the forecast of these indicators, we anticipate a revenue increase of 35.6 million guilders. Additionally, apart from the GDP and economic growth linked rise, there are two new income streams budgeted, totaling 23.4 million guilders. These include revenue from visitor entry taxes and the sale of winner shares. MP asks the following question. The 13.4 million guilders of Venere is earmarked for. The anticipated funds from Venere have, have not been, and I want to very, make it very clear that these are, the 13.4 million was what we budgeted minimum. The anticipated funds from Venere have not been des designated for a particular purpose. Instead, they are pooled into the general coffers from which allocations are made to several ministries to cover their individual expenses. In 2024, we have 200 million guilders in CapEx. This is, this is question four, by the way, Madam <coughs> Chair. However, the loan requested is for 110 million guilders. Explain the effects the government will have to pay for depreciation or interest for the upcoming years. As mentioned on page 131 of the elucidation book, the total budget of CapEx stands at 230 million guilders. Out of this amount, 90 million has been already secured, leaving a balance of 140 million. An additional 80 million is expected to be received through the NRPB, resulting in a remaining shortfall of 
$122 million for covering other capital investments. This total amount will, will require a loan. For further details on the future implications concerning depreciation and interest, I would like to refer to you to page 177 on the elucidation book. The ministry currently has 43 vacancies. 32 vacancies are not budgeted for. What are the plans to fill these vacancies and what is the plan to cover these vacancies? The ministry has not budgeted for our vacancies as it is not likely to fill 43 vacancies in one year. The ministry has currently budgeted for a specific number of vacancies and the intentions to fill these vacancies that have been budgeted for, which in itself is a challenge. And MPL, I'd like to state that um, across the board, um, when we look at, especially in the past, we look at uh, ministries putting our vacancies out there, which then impact their budget, and then eight months, nine months, ten months go by, and you haven't, you haven't filled these vacancies, whereas you could have budgeted a, a lower amount. And what we have done in the Ministry of Finance now is that we have budgeted a certain amount of months per vacancy. So instead of uh, budgeting for a full 12 years in salary, 12 months, sorry, 12 months, we budget, I think, uh, max six in some areas. Um, because realistically speaking, the time of finding someone, going through the hiring process, um, it doesn't happen in a month or two months. Next, when looking at the condition of government-owned companies such as GB and TLM, what type of financial implications will this have for 2024? Um, MP, so we had, uh, we had to ask you, through you, Madam Chair, for, for some clarity on this question. We weren't too sure which direction you were going, so we get some clarity on that during the clarification so we can answer you properly. There is a court case related to Bearing Point in 2024. Um, this case is more than 10 million gillers. This is question seven. Explain what can be expected from the court case for the Bearing Point and how the expenses can be covered. As there's, as there's a possibility that the Bearing Point will pursue legal action, I refrain from commenting on this matter currently and won't engage in any speculation about potential outcomes publicly. Last question with the MP was, what advice would the government have for the incoming government? And my advice was, you know, two by four can become two by five. MP De Weaver, next is MP De Weaver. Please explain how this 2024 budget reflects the shift towards policy-based budgeting that the government embarked on two years ago. Is this evident in the budget? Is this transition still happening? If not presented in the budget, why not? In this budget, you can see the individual policies as stipulated by the ministries. This is based on the exercise that we started two years ago with SWAB. These policies are linked with the numbers in the several tables that are mentioned in the policy paragraphs in the elucidation of the separate ministries. However, currently we are awaiting the final report of the project regarding the policy-based budgeting which will be finalized in May this year. The report will be, will be provided to us with a budget design process and roadmap towards making the budget more policy driven. But I will say that the feedback we've gotten so far from SG and among others within the Ministry of Finance is that um, we've seen an improvement within the ministries in, in regards to their budget submittals, but there is room for improvement, in, especially in particular ministries. And the overview that you requested, um, the table will be sent in the report, so you'll have it. Regarding the vacancies, and question number three, the Minister of Finance mentioned the most governments around the world are divesting from governments on companies, yes. Is this statement from the Minister of Finance foreshadowing, or what is it to come for other government on companies? This is the plan with 11 GB. Um, so I, as I mentioned yesterday, that um, coming into, coming into uh, government in 2020, this was, uh, we, were faced with, we were faced with a pandemic, and um, before the pandemic actually, we were looking at, at knowing the value of our, our government-owned companies. By knowing the value of your government-owned companies, you can also then look at strategic partnerships. 
And so that was a plan from the get-go. The pandemic then um, did change some of those plans because at, a, at that point in time, then the, you, the companies were not on a, the same value as 2020. Um, so it isn't about foreshadowing it necessarily. It's about planning and strategizing for the future. Um, there were a lot of plans in the past, actually, as I, as I heard for, let's say, Telem having a strategic partner, which I believe that if that was done then, we probably wouldn't be faced with the same issues we have now. At the end of the day, we live on a very small island, 16 square miles. 16 square miles is about the size of Stacia. And um, we don't have econ economies of scale um, when it comes to certain entities. So I, be I do believe that finding strategic partners and looking at areas of um, potential mergers can benefit the island. So I do believe in exploration, in exploration of potential divesting. And it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be for uh, a full uh, on sale of any company. MP Gums, what is the status of the pro procurement legislation? As mentioned in my presentation, phase two, phase two will be finalized, will finalize a full legislative package and, and is currently on the way. Can the minister break down the 90 million gillis capex allocation? For total breakdown, I would like to refer to page 68 of the budget book outlet, booklet. In, column, in the column 2023, there's a breakdown for the full 90 million gillis. Only approximately a half a million of the cap, total capex has been used thus far, but um, the rural projects has been on the way, but we haven't, but haven't been invoiced as yet, so that figure will change for sure because um, each road is above a million gillers. Each road, each road um, tender is above a million gillers. Provide outstanding for casino fees that was collected. Four million in outstanding fees were, were collected from casinos along with fees for specific periods aimed at preventive for the accumulation of backlogs a practice neglected in previous years. It is hoped that this trend of monthly fee, fee payments will persist in the future. And uh, so the casinos, we went after the casinos, they started to pay their backlogs and the majority of them also remain current. So totally current and paying backlogs at the same time. What is the status of the proposed sale of Veneer? As I mentioned before, this is, this is a, this has been an exploration project. Um, we would like to not go into details on the, the SA, the potential suitors. Um, but the discussions have, we have been working with, what's it called? <laughs> yeah. We have been working with an in, in, a investment capitalizing company that is dealing with all parties on this matter to see, seeking potential suitors, but also um, structuring the whole, the whole agreement. And now move over to the questions by MP Heliga Martin. Does St. Martin still have a Does St. Martin still have a credit sovereign rating? If so, what is it, and if why not? The Moody's relationship has since been rescinded during the COVID pandemic. There were cost cutting measures in effect. It was determined to end the relationship with Moody's as part of those measures. Can the minister provide Parliament with an update on the fiscal reforms? What is the current status, and what are the timelines? On November 7, 2023, the Antwerp von Landsvordering Belasting Vorming Phase 1 was submitted to the exit way for a legal department to be, to be proceeded to Parliament. This proposal will retract tax laws that are not enforced and or outdated. 
On November 10, 2023, the draft national ordinance review of formal tax law presented to the governor for forwarding to parliament. The working group tax improvements is drafting a one-sided regulation preventing double taxation. An external party is drafting le le uh, legislation products to be reviewed by the Department of Fiscal Affairs. How are the effectiveness of budgetary allocations and policies monitored? Currently, MP, each minister bears the responsibility for ensuring that the desired outcomes are achieved. This includes the monitoring of policies and budget effectiveness. The financial statement provides a detailed account of actual achievements that and associated costs. How does the budget address the stability of energy resources and communication systems? MP, we assumed you were referring to Jimmy Telem. It's important to note that these entities operate independently and are not included in the government's budget. MP, Helga Martin, Chief Madam Chair. There was a question regarding the central bank and the gold reserves. It's about a couple of paragraphs long. Do you mind if you send that one in writing or you want it fully read in writing? Perfect. Next question. Who are the current members of the supervisory board for the, of the cadaster? The current board members are Nerissa De La Rosa, Mikael Lake, Shamika Camera, Maribel Fleming, Janai Marlin. All women, I see. Yes, all female board. What are their respective functions besides their membership of supervisory board and what are their areas of expertise? The advice from the corporate the advice from the corporate governance council of October 2nd, 2023 indicated the background of the candidates and the following areas of expertise. Master of Law, Master in Accountancy, Bachelor of Architecture, Master of Accountancy, and Master of Management. Oh yeah, I see it now. You also mentioned the profile, um, sorry, the requested profiles. Profile Legal Expert, she has a Master in Law. Profile Financial Economic Sector, Master in Accountancy. Profile Engineering, Bachelor Architecture, Profile Business Management, and Finance, Master in Accountancy, and Profile Finance, Master Management. The next question was regarding the selection process conducted in compliance with the Corporate Governance Code and can Parliament review uh, this process? Yes, advertisements were published, selections and interviews have, been have taken place, and the intention of the minister was sent to the Corporate Governance Council as prescribed by the Corporate Governance Law. The advice from the Corporate Governance Council of October 2nd, 2023 confirmed ab above mentioned, and the council did not indicate to have any objections to the reappointments and appointments of the candidates. This advice should be shared by the Corporate Governance Council with Parliament. In addition to that, um, this process was not done in the past, so actually this government actually stepped the process up a lot more. We created, a prof we created profiles, we did interviews, and we did a corporate governance, which was not done in the past. So that was the first time it had been done. When were the reappointed and for how long? Three appointments happened in the period of March, 20, March 30, 2023 until March 30, 2026, so for three years, and two appointments for the period of December 7th, 2023 until December 7th, 2026, so for a period of three years. Next question was regarding their, the compliance of Articles of Incorporation. Yes, in Article 9, third section of the Statutes of Cadaster and Land Registry, it is indicated that the members can be reappointed only one time. The appointment of March 30th, 2020 of the three reappointed members are based on third section of the Statutes, while a temporary appointment of April 11th, 2023 is based on the fifth section of the Statutes, which section was used as an urgent appointment as there was no supervisory board council in place. 
It is not 100% sure if the one-time appointment of the third section also applies on appointments made based on the fifth section of statutes to prevent that the current appointment can be qualified as a secondary appointment for three members, which might not be in accordance with statutes. It is, it is decided to retract the temporary appointment of April 11, 2023 and replace the appointment retroactively with the current appointment. This is all mentioned in the national decree as published in the National Gazette number 30 of December 22, 2023. What is the status of the recruitment process of a CFO and the CEO, COO for the cadastered? The status of recruit, the recruitment process of the CFO is in the final stages and the recruitment process for the COO did not start. What changes have been made for collecting room tax and Airbnb? To date, no changes in the law have been made to collect room tax directly from Airbnb. Discussions are still ongoing with the platforms concerning a structured way forward, even though we have not been collecting room tax directly from the platforms. In 2023, we have seen an increase of approximately 4 million in room tax compared to 2022. In addition to that, um, we personally did meet with Airbnb. Um, we've sent, they have requested us to send us their legislation. Uh, we've done that for them to review. They've also discussed with us that they are willing to have their legal team also work with us to develop a holistic vacation rental legislation because they, 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 they were concerned that they as an entity were being targeted so that if, they, if they're the only ones coming on board, that then their competitors then have an unfair advantage, which is Booking.com, VRBO, Expedia, and among others. So there was, and they also asked the government, hey, listen, so when we do comply, what is then government going to do then to ensure that the others um, start to comply too? So not targeting Airbnb, because we, we have a habit of saying Airbnb specifically, but it's about the vacation rental group itself. So they are willing to help. We've sent them the legislation. They are, I must say, they are a bit slow in responding to the islands. It's not just St. Martin's or Rural Curacao. We've met as, I've met the, I'm, when I met them, it was, it was St. Martin, it was Anguilla, it was Aruba, it was a, it was a group of us um, that met in New York, and we all have the same issues. We, we, in addition to that, um, in the ministry, we are looking at other ways of targeting vacation rentals directly. There are now um, applications that allow us to now zoom in on particular units and then see costs and actually how much they make and so forth. So now we're able to do that, but then that requires a lot more manpower to be able to target on an individual basis. We have, I believe, almost close to a thousand rooms on the island. Um, are there any challenges anticipated in enforcing tax compliance among shared econ economy accommodations? Well, I just mentioned that just now. I now move on to the question by MP Roseberg. I noticed on the budget that it was an allocation of 50,000 guilders for training tax office workers, but under account of 3480, the, account, the amount was 81,000. So what is the additional amount for? Can we clarify? Within the staff of the ministry, there's a, a total amount for training for the entire ministry. Of this total amount, 50,000 guilders is allocated to belasting deans. Yeah. Yes, in addition to that, the training for uh, budget 2024, we, over the last few, uh, since COVID actually, we did uh, free Coursera, Coursera courses for the entire island for free, uh, which was done with the support of SMDF. In 2024, we cut that budget, the Coursera budget, and we ended that uh, Coursera program. And uh, we now put the money by the staff it on, because I told my team that uh, we've been putting out a lot of vacancies over the years. We put out vacancies, and we don't get the, the, the persons that, the quality persons that we want or need. And I've decided that we would not only put out vacancies to hire outside, but now we would also now start to train our own staff to put them in a position to be filled in these vacancies. We have staff, for example, that have been working for uh, 
five, 10, 15 years, and the only thing that they're missing is having a paper, having a document, but they have the experience. So uh, in the last quarter of 2023, we decided to cut one budget and put it over to trainings. And we now we have, we are now training four staff members, I believe, uh, who are busy now getting their associates in accounting. And I'll move on to the question posed by MP Christophe Emmanuel. Do you have a concrete plan in purchasing Mother Bay? And regarding the purchase of Mother Bay, we did have a, a sidebar discussion yesterday. Um, the, we did bring to the Council of Ministers, or I did bring to the Council of Ministers that, you know, Mother Bay, yes, it's um, not currently owned by the government, but it's a Sim Martin thing. Um, something that hasn't been developed for, since 1995. And that um, as a government, if we, we, well, the ministry has looked at possible, possi the possibility of purchasing Mother Bay, um, also via uh, a third party entity. But I told the council ministers, just, just purchasing Mother Bay is not enough, because then we have this big asset on the books paying interest but then we have to cover the interest, it has to also generate funds, it has to be able to pay for itself. So purchase of Mother Bay should come with a plan, right? Um, it should come with a plan as for country cinema. What do we want to see Mother Bay, Mother Bay develop into? Do we want to see towers? Do we want to see low-rise boutique hotels? Do we want to see more nature? It has to come with a plan that's able to cover the expenses, the cost of purchasing Mother Bay. Um, so that, that every minister was required to start to do their part for this plan. Um, but I do agree if there, if there is a possibility to purchase, uh, which we did start to look into. And there was, we have spoken to at least two local, two local entities um, concerning this, uh, but it has to come with a plan. Um, and I think that's the most I can say on that. MP, question two was regarding Central Bank parading to all the different community centers regarding the Caribbean Gilder. Like the answer from MP Grisha Heliga Martin, this answer is even longer than that. Do you want me to read it out or you prefer to write in? Read it out? Okay. <laughs> Guess a lot of us. <clears throat> Thank you, MP. By the regulation of a common money system for Caruso and St. Martin, it is stipulated that the Caribbean Gila must be used as an official tender within, within the Monterey Union of Curacao and St. Martin. However, the Caribbean Gila was not issued immediately in 2010 at the beginning of the new constitutional structure. And just for the viewing public, I want to make it clear. In, 20, in 2010, when we decided to go over to this current status, by law, we already had to have our own currency. So this isn't something that started in 2024, 2023, 2022, 2021. This started when we made a decision to go over to country status. So actually, we are 14 years or 13 and a half years late with our own legislation. So we are late with our own legislation. This is not something that we decided now. This was decided in 2010. So that's in very, very layman terms. We are now executing something that was not executed from 2010. As long as the issue of the Caribbean Gilder has not yet taken place, pursuant to Article 16, second and third sections, and 20, second to the fourth sections of the regulation on a common money, money system for Curacao and St. Martin, the Nez Antilles Gilder remains legal tender. However, as presented by Central Bank, it is becoming increasingly difficult to keep stock of the Nez Antilles coins and bank notes at an adequate level. Moreover, the material security specifications of the coins and bank notes are outdated. This complicates the production process because due to the relatively small production quantities, suppliers are no longer willing to accept orders. And those who do accept charge more because of the higher production costs. As I mentioned before in a, in a meeting regarding Caribbean Gilder, this costs us way more money to print an outdated currency. And I guess this answer will be somewhere in the document, but also the, the current security features are not up to date to modern times.
Furthermore, here it comes, because of the outdated security features of the Nez Antilles Giller, the level of protection from the counterfeiting is increasingly inadequate. This lack of protection coupled with the risk of shortage of certain types of coins or banknotes and the potential for subpar quality in newly produced coins and banknotes significantly risks damaging the confidence in the any Gilder, well, not Nez Gilder, as a legal tender. In the interest of safe and efficient payment system, a radical adjustment in the specifications of a legal tender within the monetary unit of correspondence margin is desirable. At the same time, merely replacing the Nez Antilles Gilder with a newly designed Nez Antilles Gilder is not permissible by law. The replacement must be the Caribbean Gilder. The moment of the, the issue of the killer will be in tandem by the country of Curacao and St. Martin via national degree and is set currently for March 31st, 2025. Parliament will be informed of the introduction. For the sake of clarity and to prevent an unnecessary discussion at this point, it is emphasized that the introduction of the Caribbean killer is a short term, not directly related to the decision about the choice between an own currency for the monetary union of, of St. Martin and Curacao, and on the one hand, dollarization, which I mentioned before. Going over to the Caribbean Gila does not mean we cannot dollarize. On the other hand, as this will take some time, namely, if St. Martin should choose to dollarize, effectively replacing the domestic currency with the US dollar will require a transition period of at least five years and must be considered. So the introduction to Caribbean Gilder does not have to frustrate or constrain a possible future decision to dollarize in the view of the time required for both the decision-making process and the transition needed to officially switch over currencies. In the meantime, it nevertheless remains an urgent and an interest of safe and efficient payment system that the current badly outdated Antilles Gilder is replaced by the Caribbean Gilder, which again, was a decision that we made going over to country status. The next question what was, three, what is the position of the Minister of Finance on dollarization? My position on dollarization is once, that, once there's a re, the proper research is done and there's more benefits for dollarization than not, um, then I'm for dollarization. Does the country of St. Martin collect money's taxes from Robbie's Lottery and Star Casino? If yes, do they consider that money to be part of money laundering? This is a very, very interesting answer. MP Christophe Emmanuel, you. I, I, I know how the Central Committee works, but I think he missed the question on what if the parliament doesn't pass the legislation for this new currency? Yeah, I see. It's, it's, it's already done. Um, thank you for, for emphasizing your question. Minister, could you respond to yeah, the so MP, the, please? Thanks. I think I said it at least a couple of times already. This is legislation from going over to country status. It's a legislation that already exists. So you'd have to now go back and retract the legislation. It's not something we're going to pass. It already exists. Going over to country status, that was the decision that we made. So there's no legislation to enact by Parliament. We are now enacting the legislation that we are laid by by 14 years. Yes, now going over to the next question. Let me, let, let me repeat the question again, actually. Does the country of St. Martin collect monies, taxes from Robbie's Lottery and Store Casino? If yes, do they consider that the money to be part of money laundering? For tax purposes in St. Martin, it is not important which qualification is given to the income. Considering this, it is not relevant for tax and income whether income forms part of money laundering or whether money is good, in brackets, or whether it can be put into a bank account, as is the case in many tax systems worldwide. The tax authorities tax income. The tax authorities tax income, regardless of its origin. If it falls under a source of income designated by, by tax laws because such income is then subject to taxation, 
This means that the individuals and legal entities' arrangements who earn such income are subject to taxation. Although earning money from crimes is illegal, tax laws often include that, including that of St. Martin, require individuals and legal entities' arrangements to declare their full income, including the income from illegal sources. This contributes to a fair tax system and ensures that people and legal entities' arrangements pay taxes on all their income, regardless of how it was obtained. Additionally, in some cases, the public prosecutor can pr prosecute tax evaders for not declaring their, in their criminal income, which may lead to additional legal actions and penalties. I love that answer. <laughs> Next, um, so just in very, very short, if you're making money, you gotta pay taxes on it, no matter how you get it. What is considered money laundering? Does a prepaid, does a prepaid credit card company require an operation license from Central Bank to operate a St. Martin? Is one needed? Based on Article 2, Paragraph 1 of the National Ordinance, Supervision of Banking and Credit Institutions, it is prohibited to carry on the business of a credit institution in St. Martin without a, prop, a prior license of the central bank. Furthermore, Article 45, Paragraph 1 states that it is prohibited to apply to the public directly or indirectly <coughs> with regards to the raising of funds or the granting of credit by parties other than the credit institutions as registered at the central bank. The central bank can grant upon request a conditional exemption, exemption for this prohibition. I now move on to the questions posed by MP Marlin. What are the risks involved in not approving the budget? Which key investments, new hire projects, and programs can be impacted? The consequence of not approving a budget is that no new commitments can be made, can be initiated. Consequently, all new programs and commitments will have to be put on hold which is partially the case with some items at the moment. If the budget isn't approved, then the 2% COLA would, wouldn't be paid, the MP said. Also, if approved, will it be paid retroactive, retroactively to January 2024? Correct, the 2% COLA can only be instated once the budget for the year 2024 is approved, and yes, this will be done retroactively to January 2024. The government of St. Martin has already made done all their part in terms, of, in terms of legislation, dealing with all the unions and dealing with all the institutions. Um, so yes, we've done our part already. The final step in the retroactive pay of the 2% COLA can only be implemented once the budget is approved. And also, this also is for the upcoming vacation pay. When imp the member, the MP then asks, Question three, when employees own stock in their company, their interest becomes aligned with those of shareholders. This can lead to an increased motivation and dedication to the company's success as employees directly benefit from improvements in the company's performance and stock value. With regards to GB, we got a window of a of shares with those employees. Oh, oh, sorry, yes. I think the MP meant win here. With, re, with regards to win here, we got, the win, we got that window. What percentage of shares will go towards employees? So we're not able to uh, say exactly what share will go to employees at the moment, but again, I do believe that it's a, a first, actually, and a great opportunity for shares of an entity to be able to uh, be shared with employees of that same institution. In addition to that, I've gotten a lot of messages today um, where actually citizens of the island actually were saying, hey, would it even be a possibility for me to own shares in that in entity, which I thought was, uh, which we didn't, we didn't discuss, but I think that's even a great idea that we could potentially raise funds where citizens could also participate in our, in our local carrier raising, raising funds um, and own a piece of, of home. So that's something that we will now also um, discuss um, with the parties involved, actually. So I did see a lot of excitement uh, when it came to that topic of 
citizens being able to own or buy shares within uh, Winnier. So we will go back and have a discussion with the parties involved. Next, the MP asks, the Minister of Finance implemented a turn to our work week for one department. Does the Minister have any other plans for the rest of the ministry and for the entire government? Yeah, so we did implement a 32 hour work week for not one department, but the whole, everyone in the build, government building on Pondville. Um, we are now busy finalizing the exit survey. Once that is done, we will then gather the data and um, possibly continue with um, the one that was mainly supported. And we will now start the process of surveying the uh, persons at the tax department and receivers for them to then also part participate in a new pilot program um, similar to the one that we did at the government building at Palmfield. And hopefully when all of, this, all of this is done, we can have a full um, send of results to the prime minister and possibly have it done um, government-wide if it, if it suits or it shows that it has a positive net effect on employees, on performance, on work-life balance. Now I'll go over to questions by MP Lacruz. What type of capital good investments are included in 2024 budget? How much budgeted and and relates to investments that were already planned in 2023. 90 million, 90 million relates to investments which have been rolled over from the 2023 budget for a total breakdown for 2024 and 2023. I would like to refer to you to page 68 of the budget booklet. Are there any major risks or uncertainties that could impact the revenue or expenditure of these projections? The risks are stated on page five of the, of the budget elucidation. They include hurricanes, inflation, a pandemic, among others. What assumptions or considerations are mentioned regarding things like inflation, economic projections, or any other factors that could influence the budget? On page one, three, and seven, there are assumptions mentioned regarding GDP, inflation, etc. These are the assumptions used for the projection in the budget. For example, on page seven, there's a table showing the expected inflation for the coming years. Can we get an update on virtual assets ordinance? Where is it? Where is that law? And what is the timeline? The answer, the Antwerp von Landsverordnung to sich, uh, virtual uh, activa Dienstverleners is at the Council of Advice. On March 19, 2024, an information session was organized with the legislative writers of the ordinance and the Council of Advice. Most likely, an advice from the Council of Advice will follow it in short after which the government can address the advice from the council advice in the NADR report, after which the draft law can, pre be, can be proceeded to parliament. Question five, how many plates were left behind every year after being printed for the past five years, especially those for public transport? Public transportation license plates are ordered based on the amount of permits issued per category. As a precautionary measure, additional plates are ordered in the event additional permits are issued or the need to replace stolen or damaged plates arise. The question, the next question, the following question from MP was, what plans would you urge the incoming government to finalize all? MP Westcott. The draft law to increase vacation allowance, is that in the making? If not, as I mentioned before, it's already, it's already, the, it's already done. The draft law for vacation allowance is already done. Question, Minister. Mm -hmm. The draft law for the increase in vacation allowance is already done. The draft law could only be done by Parliament. I mean, the draft law can only be finished, done, by Parliament to make it law. Um, 
No. Minister, so could you explain your answer to my question, please? Yes, I, I will confirm, but I believe that um, part of it, uh, the increase could be done via LVHAM. So I have to confirm with the uh, prime, prime Minister, but she does, we do have an indication that Prime Minister says she will expound that further. So either it's on its way or it's already done. I'll confirm, but in any case, the PM says she will expound it further when she comes. Okay, so the, the ordinance that regulates vacation allowance currently at 6%. Yes, and the Prime Minister said she will expound it in her absence. Okay, I'll leave it Let's to confirm that. that. Thank you. <laughs> Plans for the NRPB. Plans for the NRPB references made to the NRPB 2.0. Can any information to this vision can be shared? Um, regarding this, there's no, there's no concrete, there's no concrete decision. There have been discussions, um, suggestions on what do we do after um, NRPB is, is um, when the trust fund is closes. Um, since 2018, we have developed a lot of, we have gained a lot of knowledge and a lot of expertise. Um, staff at NRPB are fully and properly trained in a lot of um, areas. And it'd be a shame that we just allow this to just disappear. So um, we do have certain, we have had certain suggestions um, and we are going to try and put this in, in on paper. We have discussed with NRB that we should finalize these discussions and continue our plan forward. Next question was regarding the High Council of State. Whether the proposed budget in the National Budget 2024 are in line with the budget request by the High Council of State. The High Council's proposed the budgets are in line, the High Council proposed budgets are in line with what is included in the budget 2024. Did government, next question, did government share, oh, the general audit chamber concerns for, for the, General pension fund, if so, what is the plan? We are currently reviewing the report, but it has not yet been deliberated upon in the Council of Ministers. Next question, making a public budget more user-friendly. The ministry will investigate the possibilities of this. Next question, rules regarding income generating initiatives that are currently ongoing. In the policy paragraphs for each ministry, the, they detail the income generating measures they are currently working on. Next was compliance on collection. The taxes in total have been increased compared to the year 2023 with about at least 42 million guilders. Is there any update on the administration of collections and the cleaning up of the prepaid accounts? The prepaid, the prepaid account cleaner project has not yet started, but it has but it is a part of phase two of the public financial management engagement currently happening within the ministry as mentioned in the presentation. Next question was regarding Enya. MP stated the line item dividend by central bank with no amount, there should be a profit sharing according to the central bank charter, etc. The answer, Dividends were paid out in former years in accordance with the statute of the central bank. With regard to the NIA solution, it is indeed proposed for central bank to generate fixed yearly dividends. As we speak, a document is being drafted as a follow-up on our meeting on NIA last Monday, March 18, 2024, to further discuss with the Central Committee of Parliament. With regard to the effect of NIA solution on the budget for the year 2024, currently, NIA does not affect the budget, as the solution is not formally established. Once it is finalized and clear, and clear, the effect of ENIA will be incorporated accordingly in the appropriate budget on which it will have the effect. Next question was regarding Airbnb, five million budgeted. We have not collected anything directly for Airbnb as I previously mentioned. However, we have seen an increase in the lodging room tax and income tax, it, sorry, the lodging and room tax in 2023 compared to 2022. 
during the 2023, we had a social awareness campaign to provide awareness to the general public on the obligation to pay lodging room tax on revenue from Airbnb and other platforms. We expect that this, is, this also led to an increase in the collected lodging room tax in 2023. And we had a significant amount of inquiries and emails regarding this in 2023 and how to pay actually. Next question was regarding lottery fee. No, we haven't. Uh, the question is, there has been a one standard amount since 2022, 3.3 million dollars was on the budget for the last three years. Have you collected the exact amount that was due from all lottery fees? No, we haven't. Do note that the revenue for lotteries as included in the budget is on an accrual accounting basis. This means that the amount as stated is how much revenue we should collect on a yearly basis, not what was actually collected. The taxes of the country, on the, on the contrary, as included in the budget is on a cash accounting basis, which is based on how much money we expect to actually collect. Hence the reason why the budget amount 2023, the actual amount, and the budget amount 2024 are the exact same amount for the lottery fees. The amount in the budget is not a portrayal of the amount, the actual amount received, but because revenue of the lottery is accounted on a accrual basis, meaning the actual showed the accrued amount for the year. The next question was regarding the tourist tax. Tourist tax increased to 19 million gillers. It hasn't been adjusted. Yes, MP, I apologize for that. We did send the correct version now. The tourist tax, as including the budget 2024, is not 19, but is 9 million gillers. The legislation is currently by the CR. MP question 12. Participation of a government refers to any government-owned or partially-owned entity. Report on page 113. The most recent annual report is 2019. Is the overview of government-owned participatory entities 113 still accurate? This information is still accurate, MP. And the final question by MP Sarah Scott Williams. And yeah, an amount on the topic of Enya for 2.5 as an expense. Will an expense be made in 2024? If so, where is the central bank dividend amount put in the budget as a receipt for central bank? In the budget for the year 2024, there is no expense for Enya. It is expected for St. Martin to contribute as of 2027 a, a yearly amount of 2.3 million guilders to the resolution fund Enya. Once we have established all the effects of the final Enya solution, this can be incorporated accordingly in the future budgets. Madam Chair, that is all the questions and answers posed for the Ministry of Finance. I look forward to any clarifications necessary. Thank you, Minister, for those answers as they relate to the Ministry of Finance. And of course, now members of Parliament have the opportunity to react. I see that we have MP Grisha Heiliger who wishes to do so, and I invite you, MP, to take the floor. Good evening, Madam Chair, Lady. Good evening to everyone. Thank you, Minister, for your answers. Uh, just um, not a clarification, but it seems that one of my questions was, like, the first question, actually, was skipped. That was regarding the tourism tax. Um, that was number one question. Based on my line of questioning, Madam Chair, Lady, went straight to the second question. You want me to request? Speak the question for you. you. Yes? Okay. Sorry, Madam Chair, Lady, through you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Minister, you can address that one time. Okay, please. Yes, about, yes, um, after you, my staff sent me. Um, yes, the, we have here that. The, we mentioned the tourist tax in our presentation because we presented the budget as a whole, representing all ministries. But the tourist tax, which is initially started off as a health tax, actually initiated um, in the ministry of, between the Ministry of Vedas and Tiat. So we, we, those questions, we hope that they will have to answer regarding uh, 
the question was how will, how will it be implemented? How will it be paid by the airport? All these questions were related to, um, unfortunately, for the Ministry of Bay of Our apologies. MP Grisha, that is sufficiently responded to. Then I invite MP Lacruz to take the floor. Thank you and good evening to one and all, Minister and your support staff. I missed, I also, I think you missed one of my questions and I think if it was one minister that should have been able to answer that question, it would actually be the Minister of Finance and it relates to the cost to government for court cases. There were two questions that were asked to all ministers. You answered one, but you missed the other. If you'd like, I'll repeat it. What has it caused the country in court cases? Please elaborate on court cases that we've lost and how much we've won and if there are any pending court cases and what is the plan of government. Per Ministry. Minister, you want to react to, please, Minister, react to MP Yes, I want, I want to have, um, some clarity because MP Lacruz mentioned that this is a question stated to all ministries and um, so now you're seeking clarity in particular for our court cases in the Ministry of Finance. So what cases? The question was asked to all ministries. So in Ministry finance. of Finance. Okay, perfect. Okay, we'll, we'll, you have one, right? Okay. Minister? So currently, we only have one case, which is the Barron Point case. And it hasn't gone to court as yet, the recent one. MP Lacruz, okay, then thank you, Minister. Thank you, MP Lacruz. Then I continue with MP Christophe Emmanuel. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and good evening to everyone. Madam Chair, just to be clear, I know the minister doesn't anticipate where I'm going with this one already because he himself said it's an interesting question. Just to be clear, I would just like to hear the minister reiterate that again for the whole entire general public of St. Martin, that it is good for the government and the tax office to collect illegal money from illegal activities once it goes for taxes. Madam Chair, I, I just want to be clear. I want the minister to say it and repeat it again because, Madam Chair, this is what I'm saying. Here you have two entities, Madam Chair, two entities. You have Robbie's Lottery that was given a license to operate in the country. You have Star Casino given a license to operate in the country. Madam Chair, both of these entities make money, both of them. So let me say, Madam Chair, both of them make $100 each. They are taking $40 each, Madam Chair, and they are giving it to the government for taxes. Now they want to take the $60, Madam Chair, and deposit on a bank account, but they can't because the $60 is illegal. The $60 is considered money laundering. But Madam Chair, the $40 is good money. I'm trying to make it to make sense, Madam Chair. So I want the minister to explain it again. Is he saying it doesn't matter where, how, what the money is derived from, from an entity operating in this country? So Madam Chair, if you have a business and you derive money from drug activities, from trafficking, from whatever, once you pay taxes, I think that money is good. 
I want to be clear exactly what the minister just read a while ago. It doesn't matter where this money derived from. It doesn't matter. Once it goes for paying taxes, it's good money. Can the minister really clarify if that is the case, Madam Chair? Thank you. Thank you, MP Emmanuel. Minister, you want to do that now? You respond directly to, since it's more of clarifying your answer? Yes, I'll be very clear, Madam Chair, also, that this is not that, that the minister's answer. This is what our laws, this is our, our legislation. Um, so taxes don't clarify, doesn't classify funds. So I'll just read the answer again to be very clear. For tax purposes on St. Martin, it is not important which qualification is given to the income. Considering this, it is not relevant for tax and income whether income forms part of a money laundering or whether money is good or whether it can be put into a bank account, as is the case in many tax systems worldwide. The tax authority's income, regardless of its origin, if it falls under a source of income designated by tax laws because such income is then subject to taxation. This means that individuals and legal entities arrangements who earn such income are subject to taxation. Although earning money from crimes is illegal, tax laws often, including that of St. Martin, require individuals and legal entities arrangement to declare their full income including income from illegal sources. This contributes to a fair tax system and ensures that people and legal entities arrangements pay taxes on all of their income, regardless of how it was obtained. Additionally, in some cases, the public prosecutor can prosecute tax evaders for not declaring in criminal income, which may lead to additional legal actions and penalties. Madam Chair, that's the answer. Again, that's our tax laws. Thank you, Minister. And we have the um, response. I'm sure MP Christophe Emmanuel might want to come back to it. But before we do any of that, let me adjourn for maybe five minutes so that we can restart the system. So we adjourn now until about five minutes past eight. Meeting adjourned.